Tic Tac, time to rock. Good evening and good morning and good afternoon to yep. all the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, everyone who's watching right now. I'm David Wood. Everyone's favorite. Everyone's favorite. Hey, turn the, hey, audio, turn off. the audio off. What audio? Never mind. Is it you or me? It does that sometimes. No, okay. that was it. You're good. You're good. You're good. You don't need to call in help. You don't need to call in help. Problem solved. Chat, tell us where you're coming from, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Sam, well, I and everyone else over here who's watching right now, uh, send this out to all our friends on Twitter and Facebook to let them know we're live. Why don't you yeah. go ahead and tell everyone what we've been doing right now? Okay. Uh, it, your thing froze for a second. Oh, yeah? You oh, see yeah. that? Yeah. Or is it still working for you? All right. Just uh, uh, sound sound check. Can you guys hear me? Because it froze for a minute, and then I was going to make a comment. Just want to make sure. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> As you know, before I even do that, let's just ask the Lord to bless us. Who... That's me. Good. Oh. All right. Let me know when we can go. Go. Okay. Sorry, guys. We're getting some uh, technical difficulties. But again, in Jesus' name, we ask the Father to bless this session. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Cover every one of us with the blood of Jesus. Anoint us to speak truth without error and to speak it accurately, to glorify Christ and expose Islam so that Muslims get saved. And Father, have your way. Fill us with the Spirit and bless the Internet connection so that we can be used by your Spirit to magnify Jesus. Increase in us, Lord Jesus. Father, Holy Spirit, we love you in Jesus' name. You guys know it's my habit to invoke the Lord because apart from Christ, we're not sufficient for the task. Now, I guess we're going to be talking about Allah praying. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted, wanted, to, wanted to address a couple comments first here at the beginning because um, seem to have the technical difficulties more when we get started yes. rather than later. So before we actually get into a topic, it's good to uh, spend a couple minutes checking everything. Uh, just so everyone knows, um, Radical Moderate, who is a who is a tech guy, uh, he sent me some stuff, um, some. Uh, scans to perform while I'm doing a live stream. I didn't want to do it now until I actually understand what I'm doing and, and read up on it exactly how to do it. Um, but yeah, so he said he said we can we can figure out exactly where the problem is. He said I have to actually be doing a live stream and then to run scans and it's going to show where the problems are. And so we'll be doing that probably today or Friday or maybe I'll just do a completely separate live stream that's <laughs> just for uh, just for uh, the tech stuff. But um, we will be having some technic uh, technical problems periodically just because the internet is uh, fluctu fluctuating up and down. Don't know if it's a computer. Don't know if it's my router. Don't know if it's the internet service provider. We're going to figure all that out. But uh, as of right now, we're, uh, we've are we been through worse. So uh, yeah. let's go ahead and start. Hey, Sam, I wanted to show you this comment here. <laughs> yes, please. And as is, your go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I wanted to show you this awesome comment, right? Because, Sam, you remember, I think it was two days ago, we talked about Jesus being the son of, son of God. Remember that? Yeah. And so in that video, we specifically addressed the very common claim of Muslim apologists that when Christians say that Jesus is the son of God, we simply mean that he didn't have a father and therefore God is his father. And since that's all we mean, that Jesus didn't have a human father, so God is his father, then why wouldn't we also say that Adam is the son of God. That's and the they take this as our argument, even though this is not what Christians use. This is not why we say that Jesus is the son of God. And we had an entire section on the video going through that. And check this out. Here's the Muslim response. You ready for the Muslim response? Yes, go ahead. I'm gonna I'll give it to you here. Okay. So this is, the, this is the response to that video, right? In the comment section of that video. Go to the video. Go to the video on Jesus being the son of God, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the most recent comment. The most recent comment is, you call Jesus son of God because he have no father and you call him God. What about Adam who doesn't have father and mother? Is he God too? <laughs> okay. Sam, you ever, you ever feel like we're just talking to a wall? All the time. It's obvious he just read the title, the mm -hmm. description of the video, and did not even bother listening to the video for him to make that comment when the entire point of that video was to refute this canard this red hair this red herring this mm -hmm. drama so, yeah yeah and so yeah, this yeah. is uh man yeah. it's almost it's almost like these guys are it's almost like these guys are saying hey no matter how many and no matter how clearly you refute you refute what we're saying we're just going to keep saying it anyway and Please. our hearts are so hard 
and we, we are so spiritually blind that no amount, no amount of argumentation or evidence will ever change our minds because we are not listening. We have built a wall around us. And as fast as you, Sam Shimon, are trying to tear down that wall, we can build it up even faster. You take down one brick, we'll put up two. You know, honestly, David, these guys do make a strong case for the tea and tulip, total depravity. And I'm not insulting them. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. they really make a strong case that because sin is so powerful and the, the influence of Satan is so powerful, it does require the sovereign Holy Spirit of the living God to set them free and enable them to see the truth and accept it. So, I mean, wow, it's it's unbelievable. We spent I don't know how long refuting that canard and yet. Here's a Muslim saying, oh, well, if Jesus is the son of God, he has no father, then Adam's the son of God. Okay. Adam's God, too. All right. What are you going to say? Matter of fact, we got a comment over here. Uh, this is Andre responding to Salmon Player. He says, you are blinded. So he, so it was just coincidence that we both brought up the same point, because he brought this up uh, a little before. We just made that point. <clears throat> he says, Salmon Player, you are blinded. Corinthians wow. 4, 4. The God of yeah. this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. They yeah. cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, the image of wow. God. And you, and we you can see this like over and over again. Yeah. yeah. And that's, by the way, he meant to say 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, because he didn't signify whether it's First or Second Corinthians. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. But see, again, because we're led by the same Spirit, we'll often come to the same conclusions by the grace of God's Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. So, wow, interesting he said the same thing we just said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite interesting. And by the way, if you're wondering why I was laughing, because I'm actually looking at the comments, and yeah. I'm looking at my face, and I have some of the goofiest facial expressions known to mankind. Well, yeah, I mean, if your face is already goofy, and then you make right. facial expressions, those facial expressions are also going to be goofy. Yeah, I see, man. I don't shoot. I'm proof that... You don't get into heaven by good looks. Uh, Anthony and I have been um, been doing, a, well, we just finished up a, a pretty long series going through what the Muslim sources say about Allah having physical body parts and so on. And uh, here we have a comment. Hi, hi, all. David, I have used some of yours and co, referring mainly to Anthony here, uh, material about Adam looking like Allah on a live chat, and it has opened up a few cans of worms. And... Uh, yeah, guys, if you uh, if you keep tuning in to the the live streams with Sam and with Anthony, um, you'll be able to wreak havoc. Uh, whether you're doing this on live stream or on Facebook or Twitter or talking to a Muslim, because so many of the Muslim objections, so many of the objections that they use, um, one don't really apply to Christianity. They're 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 attacking straw men, as you saw with the comment about the Muslim saying, "Ah, you claim that Jesus is the Son of God because he had no earthly father," right? as if that's why we claim that Jesus is the Son of God. And then he attacks that. But that's not our argument. So that's called a straw man in, 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 uh, in logic. Um, if you're not attacking your opponent's actual position, you're misrepresenting and distorting it, and then attacking your own misrepresentation, they call that attacking a straw man. You're not attacking a real man, talking, you're attacking a straw man. And so uh, we see that over and over again. So m most of their arguments against Christianity fall apart just based on showing them that they're attacking based on their own ignorance of what we actually say or their own deception about what we say. But uh, e even further, what happens is their objections can usually be flipped right back on Islam. And they don't know this because their leaders keep this information from them. So when they say, and this is, this is what Anthony and I have been covering, uh, when they say, Ah, you believe Jesus had, you believe God had a physical body because you believe Jesus is God. And they think this is a big problem, not just completely ignoring the fact that, that we believe in the incarnation. They don't know about their own sources, which talk about Allah having a literal body, literal body parts. And so once you learn that information and flip it right back on them, they, uh, they're going to run into all kinds of problems. Yeah. All right, Sam, let's take, uh, let's take one comment from a Muslim here. Yes. Everyone's favorite Muslim in the comment section. Salmon yes, sir. player. Man, Salmon, baby. He is a player. Play, play. Players keep playing with the truth. <laughs> what's it What's it this time? I'm like, I'm sorry, guys. All right. See, I'm Salmon player here. And then we're going to get into our topic. Again, we just noticed that the, the technical difficulties happen tend to happen more. Now, they can happen anytime, but they tend to happen more right when we're logging on. Um Hopefully that's some information that can help a tech guy figure this out. But um, Salmon Player says, lol, 
Injil is the gospel of Jesus, which Christianity doesn't have. Injil was given in word form to Jesus. So keep in mind, Sam, two things yes. here. One, yes. we don't have the gospel yes. of Jesus. That's one yeah. claim. And I'm, I'm sensing that that's going to contradict the Quran. And two, the Injil was given in word form. So it's that's not right. actually referring to a book or a text. That's the second claim. I'm guessing, I, I make a prediction here. I'm going to predict that that also is going to contradict the Quran. But let's see. If Sam and Player has just renounced Islam and declared that the Quran is filled with lies. Yeah. What's interesting is that your prophecy turns out to be true. So you're more of, pro more of a prophet than Muhammad was, right? Well, I am the <clears> word <throat> of Allah. Oh, you're right. According to Muhammad Hijab, I am the word of Allah. You are, you are, and you are one big word, I may add. But anyway, if you go to chapter 5, verses 46 to 47, there you'll be told quite clearly that the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus is in the possession, possession of the Christians at the time of Muhammad. So if you can, David, I don't have the crown in front of me, as the Lord Jesus fills us with his spirit to do justice to these topics, so he can be glorified and Muslims get saved and Christians get strengthened. Chapter 5, Surah al Maida, chapter 5, verses 46 to 47. Two things. It speaks of the gospel given to Jesus, which he said was oral. But then it says that gospel is in the possession of the Christians, Ahl al-Injil, at the time of Muhammad. So let's read that if you, mm -hmm. if you can. <clears throat> what do you want, 46 and 47? Yeah, 5, 46, 47, because he's talking about the gospel. He didn't say the Torah. Any, pre any, the Torah, yes. any preference, Pixel, Shakir, or Yusuf Ali? Whatever is the most accurate. Usually it's Pixel Arbery, but, you know, hey, you choose. All right, let's go with it. <clears throat> and we caused Jesus, son of Mary, to follow in their footsteps, confirming that which was revealed before him in the Torah, and we bestowed on him the gospel wherein is guidance and a light, confirming that which was revealed before it in the Torah, a guidance and an admonition unto those who ward off evil. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. Whoso judges not by what Allah has revealed, such are evil livers. Okay, two things to note from this section from the Quran. And I want the Christians to hear this, and David can also add <clears throat> his comments. Two things to note. Number one, it does say the gospel that Jeel was given to Jesus. So... We do believe, and just, just to be clear, we do believe that Jesus did proclaim the gospel orally and that he himself is the good news of God in the flesh. We don't believe Jesus walked around with a book. But we also believe that his followers not only preached the same gospel orally, but some of them were commissioned by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit to inscripturate, write down the gospel that Jesus proclaimed, for instance, Matthew and John, and we have no reason to reject <clears throat> the authorship of Matthew and John, because again, Muslims inconsistently appeal to liberal critical scholarship to say, well, we don't know who wrote Matthew, we don't know who wrote John. According to who? The early church? The disciples of the disciples of the apostles? For instance, this is important for Christians to note. Irenaeus, he was the bishop in France, writing around 180 A.D., Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. So here you have John, his disciple Polycarp, and then his disciple Irenaeus. And Irenaeus affirms Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, John wrote John. <clears throat> we have no reason <clears throat> to question the historicity of his testimony. And this is actually satisfies the Senna, the Isnat system of Islam, right? Muslims boast about an unbroken chain of transmitters all the way to Muhammad, reliable <clears throat> authorities that pass on what the person before them said. Well, Irenaeus is not only a reliable authority, he was martyred for his love of Jesus and never recanted his faith in Christ. So you don't get more reliable than that. A disciple of Polycarp, who also was martyred because of his love of Jesus, and Polycarp was an eyewitness to John the Apostle. So you don't get more authoritative, more reliable than these chains of transmitters. He says John wrote John, Matthew wrote Matthew. So Matthew and John recorded by inspiration of the Holy Spirit what Jesus preached orally. Now, coming to the Quran, the Quran agrees. It says the gospel given to Jesus, 546, is the same gospel that Muhammad's Christian contemporaries 
are supposed to judge by. That's 547. Let the people of the gospel, it's talking to Muhammad's contemporaries, Ahlal Injil, you followers of the gospel, judge by it. Judge by what God has revealed in it. And then what does it say if they fail to judge by that gospel, David? What did it say in 47? You got to judge mm -hmm. by the gospel or you're no better than those who rebel. Wait, why would Muhammad tell the Christians of his day, judge by whatever gospel you have, because if you don't, then you are rebels and disbelievers and Allah will punish you basically for failing to judge by whatever gospel you have if the gospel they had is not the gospel of Jesus Christ mentioned in verse 46. Yeah, uh, it, it, I mean, just think about this, right? Allah's command, and the, according to Muslim scholars across the board, Allah's commands in the Quran are perfectly clear. He tells Christians to judge by the gospel. But according to Sam and Player, we don't have the gospel. And therefore, he's just, he's calling, he's telling, he's saying that Allah is telling us to do something we can't possibly do. Allah says, we're rebels, we're in rebellion against him, if we yes. don't judge by the gospel. And Sam and Player says, but Christians don't even have the gospel. Yeah. And so and Allah, was, Allah's, yeah, Allah's just trying to de trick and deceive us. And he obviously, I guess, he knows more about the existence or the loss of the gospel than Allah and his messenger. And yet Muslims always tell me, Allahu Alam and Allah and his messenger know best. Mm -hmm. But Salmon player knows even better than Allah's messenger. Now that was the Quran. I'm going to give this narration hadith. And by the way, glory to God for modern technology. You can read the major collections of the Sunni hadiths online for free in English. Go to sunnah.com. S U N N A H dot com. The major collections of hadiths <clears throat> that Sunnis swear by, Jamit Turmidi, En Nisai, you name it, it's there online for free, translated in English. This comes from Jamit Turmidi, <clears throat> Volume 5, Book 39, Hadith 2653 in English. Hadith 2653 in English, which you can find, Sunnah.com. It's graded Sahi, Sahi. Sound. Now, why, why do I want to read this? Guys, watch what Muhammad said about the existence of the Injil that God revealed. <clears throat> Narrated Jubair bin Nufair from Abu Darda, who said, We were with the Prophet when he raised his sight to the sky. Then he said, This is the time when knowledge is to be taken from the people. Until what remains of it shall not amount to anything. So Ziyad bin Labid al-Ansari, say that five times fast, <laughs> said, how will it be taken from? Notice this question, David. Mm -hmm. How can knowledge be taken from us while we recite the Quran? By Allah, we recite it, and our women and children recite it. He said, "May you be bereaved of your mother, O Ziad." Good, good way to I talk used, to people, by the way. Yeah, yeah. No, man, he's a mercy unto mankind. What are you talking about? Says, it is mercy. I mean, <laughs> he's talking about. He's saying that knowledge will not pass away from the Muslims, right? Yeah. Sounds like he's saying something positive about Muslims. <clears throat> <laughs> Muhammad, Muhammad's response, I hope your mother dies. <laughs> yeah. is, you catch it? Yeah. So it is merciful to say, may Allah kill your mother. Yeah. What's wrong with you? He's the mercy unto mercy. mankind. Mercy. And so it must be mercy for him to invoke his mother dying. I mean, they'll say, well, it's an Arabic expression. doesn't mean it literally. All right, fine. May you be bereaved of your mother, O Ziyad. I used to consider you among the fuqaha, meaning the well-learned, uh, knowledgeable of the people of Al Medina. Now watch, folks, what Muhammad says. The Torah and Injil are with the Jews and Christians. But what do they avail of them? Did you catch it? Mm -hmm. The Torah and the Injil are in the possession of the Jews and Christians. Not a corrupted Torah, not a corrupted Injil. And yet they have the true Torah and Injil and they still lack knowledge. So just because you have the Quran doesn't mean you're going to have knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there so, you go. But, but, but notice, so we have Allah saying that Christians have the gospel. And that we have to judge by it or it, we're in rebellion against him. And here we have Muhammad saying that Christians have the gospel. But oh, we have Sam and Player saying the Injil is the gospel of Jesus, which Christianity doesn't have. Yes, Allah says that's... we have it. Muhammad says we have it. Sam and Player says we don't have it. So according <laughs> to Sam and Player, Allah and Muhammad are liars. And we can't trust what's in the Quran and in the Hadith, and therefore we should all renounce Islam right now. 
And, and you know what's amazing, David? Mm -hmm. Instead of admitting this is what the Quran teaches, he actually pits the Quran against the Quran because he quoted chapter 5, verse 14 to show we don't have it. He just quoted, I just saw 514. That's why I said, oh my goodness, are you serious? We just read the Quran. Yeah. And we just so, read so, so, so notice, yeah, best case scenario, the Quran is contradicting itself right now, right? He's, he's saying that the, but the Quran contradicts itself on this point, guys. You can't <laughs> trust what the Quran says in one place. You have to go with the Quran, with what the Quran says in a different place. Yeah. All there right. you go. Hey, let, let me read too many, two, two more verses and then we'll go to, uh, verse 514 if you want to. Yeah, that's fine. We'll have okay. a field day. I mean, amazing. But Just wanted anyway. to uh, read chapter 7, verse 157. Those who follow the apostle, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the Torah and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. So it's talking about Jews and Christians. And it says, we find Muhammad mentioned in our own scriptures, in the Torah and the gospel. So according to Allah, do we have the Torah and the gospel? Yep, it's with if them. If we have them, we're reading them, and we find Muhammad mentioned. But but Sam and Player says we don't have them. Allah, yeah, you guys have them. It's like Allah is saying, how can I make it any more clear to you that you have them? <laughs> and Sam and Player is saying, look, no matter how many times Allah says that you have them, you don't have them. Trust me, I am the new prophet here. Don't listen to Allah. Don't listen to Muhammad. I'm starting my own religion. Sam and Playerism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember, Sam and Player knows best more yeah, than yeah. Allah. Knows. And Sam and Player knows best. All right, let me read one more. Uh, say, O oh people, it's uh, Surah 5, verse 68. See if this, everyone tell me if this sounds like the Quran is saying that we don't have the Torah and the gospel. Therefore, we need to just abandon our religious texts and just believe in Islam. Chapter 5, verse 68. Say, O oh people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. Allah says we have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the revelation that has come to us. And Sam and Player says, no, you don't have that. So so is, we just have no ground to stand upon? Over and over, Allah, over and over, Allah tells Jews and Christians that our scripture is the Torah and the gospel. And Sam and Player says, no, we, we, we just don't have it. So did you want to look at 514? Yeah, in fact, just to give further confirmation, mm -hmm. I just want to read this from Ibn Ashaq. He identifies what the gospel of Jesus is. I want this because this is going to help people uh, in, in, in seeing what the gospel is. If I can, let me just do this. comes from Sirat, Sirat al-Rasulullah, which is available in English. It's available in English. Translation by, I can't pronounce his last name. Is it Alfred Guillaume? Guillaume. Is that Guillaume. Yeah. Guillaume. Like, like okay. our friend Guillaume. It's the exact same word. Okay, that's now, the French. That's the French version of William. That's how French people say oh, William. It's Guillaume, oh, right? It's like oh, let's pronounce this in the most ridiculous way possible. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, this is from pages 103, 104 of the English translation titled "The Life of Muhammad," a translation of Ibn Ashaq's or Sirat Rasulullah. This is the oldest extant biography on the life of Muhammad. We don't have the original <clears throat> or a copy of the original. What we have is copies of the edited, expurgated edition by Ibn Hisham, and I'll explain why that's important. Folks, notice what the oldest extent copy on Muhammad's life says the gospel is. Here you go. Among the things which have reached me about what Jesus, the son of Mary, stated in the gospel, which he received from God for the followers of the gospel, Ahl al-Injil, that term again, and applying a term to describe the apostle of God is the following. Now notice what he says, folks. Jesus is preaching the gospel he received from God for the Ahl al -Injil, the followers of the gospel. It is extracted from what John the Apostle set down for them when he wrote the gospel for them from the testament of Jesus, son of Mary. John wrote down the gospel that Jesus preached, and he wrote the gospel down for the followers of the gospel. So here, the earliest extant biography on Muhammad's life agrees with the Christians John wrote the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is ironic because that's the gospel that's the most attacked by Muslims and liberals. And then what's cited is John 15, verses 23 to 16, verse 1. He that hateth me <clears throat> hateth the Lord. Now notice, uh, David, conveniently, when it's citing the gospel, they don't even cite it word for word. Because notice what's missing is a reference to God being his father. Mm -hmm. Because if you read the gospel, it's he that hates me hates my father also. But they change it to 
hateth the Lord. This gives you an idea of the reticence, the unwillingness of Muslims to identify God as Father. He that hateth me hateth the Lord. And if I had not done in their presence works which none other before me did, they had not sinned. But from now they are puffed up with the pride and think that they will overcome me and also the Lord. But the word that is in the law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause, without reason. But when the Comforter has come, whom God will send to you from the Lord's presence. See how they twisted it? Mm-hmm. It's whom the Father will send in my name. But anyway, and the Spirit of truth which shall, will have gone forth from the Lord's presence, he shall bear witness of me and you also, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have spoken unto you about this, that ye should not be in doubt. What's the point? Ibn Ishaq says, John wrote down the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that Jesus received from from God, Allah. And he cites John 15, 23, 16 to 1, a prophecy of the coming Holy Spirit, which Ibn Ishaq actually thinks is Muhammad. Even though he's wrong, what's the point, folks? Earliest extent biography on Muhammad's life, edited by Ibn Hisham a century later. Ibn Hisham leaves this citation in the biography, meaning he approves of it, identifies John's gospel as the gospel of Jesus. Surprise, mm-hmm. surprise. Mm-hmm. All right, now, uh, Sam and Player has a, a follow-up. He says, Sam, how does that refute me? I meant that Christianity doesn't currently have it. In addition, Injil was written after verbal speech. Ahmed Didot explained this. You fools. Worst refutation ever. And he put worst refutation ever in all caps. So you know he's serious. But uh, by the way, now we know where he's getting his information from, right? Ahmed Didot. Like like one of the king of all deceivers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but uh, let, let, let's go with that. How does this refute me? I meant that Christianity doesn't currently have it. So we must have had the gospel. Christians must have had the gospel in the seventh century, right? Because that's when that's when Allah says that we're reading it. He tells us we ha- we have to judge by it, and so on. Muhammad said that we have it. So Simon Player must be saying, yeah, you had it in the seventh century, but you don't have it now. Now okay. this is confusing because if we had it in the seventh century, that means it was reliably preserved and transmitted from the first century to the second century to the third century to the fourth century to the fifth century to the sixth century and into the seventh century, right. which means that Christians across the Christian world would have had it. They even had it in Arabia and somehow, according to Sam and Player, it completely disappeared. It just poof, every copy Everywhere. Now, Sam, don't we have copies? Don't we have copies of the gospel long before the time of Muhammad, during the time of Muhammad, and after yes. the time of Muhammad? Yes, we have. With John, we have many copies, not only in Greek, but in Syriac and Latin, before, during, and after the time of Muhammad, and they're identical to what we read today. So I don't know how anyone can say with a clear face that We do not have the gospel that Jesus proclaimed, which John wrote down, or put John aside. We don't have the gospel that would have been in the possession of the Christians at the time of Muhammad when the manuscript evidence, we have copies of the gospels before, during, after Muhammad are identical. In other words, I don't care which copy of which gospel you pick up at whatever time period. They're going to basically read the same and present the same God, the same Jesus, the same spirit, the same message of salvation in spite of variant readings. And if we're going to talk about variant readings, which he didn't mention, but I assume he will, we're going to have a field day with the thousands of variant readings of the Quran and all its missing parts. But with that said, the manuscript evidence that's still preserved, still extent, <clears throat> demonstrates that whatever gospel they read at the Muhammad, it's with us today. Because we have copies before, during, and afterwards, and it's identical to the New Testament we possess and we read currently. So, yeah, and uh, my goodness, if you're just if you're going to sit there and say, "Hey, even though you have copies that go back well before the time of Muhammad, I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say there was some mysterious break in there, and what you have today just doesn't. If you're going to say that, then great. Well, we can just say that you don't have what Allah revealed to Muhammad. We can just say it. The, the, the Quran that Muhammad brought was completely different from later Qurans. You say, oh, no, 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 but, but, but we can trace it all the way back. Well, we can trace the gospel back to the same exact time as Muhammad. And you say, no, 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 you don't have it now. So uh, I'm sorry. If you, if you can just say it, if you can just speak the gospel into non-existence, 
<laughs> then we can speak the Quran in non-existence. So, sorry, salmon also, player. By the way, has Salmon Player ever come with a good argument? No, no, because unfortunately you can see whose influence is. It is Ahmad Didat, and I su suspect Zakir Naik, because Zakir Naik was called Didat Plus, yep. that he was Didat, yep. but then more. So clearly the fact that he mentioned Didat tells me that he's been feasting on Didat as well as Zakir Naik. So mm -hmm. we see why. He argues the way he does, but by the grace of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, I pray he wakes up mm -hmm. and sees that these arguments are actually pathetic. But interestingly, he's talking about Jesus preaching it orally. If he has a problem with Jesus preaching it orally, well, David, last time I checked, Muhammad was illiterate, so he had no no choice but to preach the Quran orally, and others wrote it down for him. Well, may maybe they wrote something completely different down. Yeah. And and here, and here and here we could here we could also and here we would also say no, but Muhammad was there. Well, Muhammad wasn't there when Uthman burned all the Qurans. Right, right. No, it, it would never cross my mind to say that Uthman just introduced some completely different Quran. That would, I would think that's ridiculous. But those are the kinds of things Muslims say about the Bible, and so they should take these kinds of claims uh, very seriously. But notice what we have here, everyone. Um, Allah says that He revealed the Torah and the Gospel. He said that Christians still had the Torah and the Gospel in 7th century Arabia, and that Christians and Jews have to judge by the gospel and the Torah, and that we have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the gospel and the Torah. So notice, according to Sam and Player, we have no ground to stand upon, because the only scriptures that we had to stand upon, we no longer have. Yep. Uh, we have copies from before the time of Muhammad, during the time of Muhammad, and after the time of Muhammad. They're the same as what we have now, and if if Allah didn't mean the gospel, then even Muslims themselves were confused and ignorant because when you ask the early Muslims, what does it mean by gospel? They start quoting the gospel of John, wow. right? Well, so gospel. Muslims themselves were misled and deceived by Allah and Muhammad so that they didn't even know what the word gospel meant. So notice if, if all of this is correct, and by the way, we also have claims, uh, do we not, Sam, that the gospel was between the hands, between the hands in the 7th century, right? Of course, yeah. yes. You go to chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, if you want to look it up, that's up to you. And then in chapter 5, verse 48, it's right there. It says that the Quran confirms what was between his hands, mm -hmm. his hands, mm -hmm. right? And the word sadaqah means to bear witness to its veracity, mm -hmm. to its truthfulness, to its accuracy. And it says, between his hands, baina <clears throat> yadeya or literally, Baina Yadei, his hands. So you have from the Quran itself mm -hmm. that whatever scriptures Muhammad had access to, because between his hands is an Arabic idiom, meaning what he had access to. Mm -hmm. he, and whatever he had access to, he confirms to be true. And so that means the gospel and the Torah, because in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, it's talking about the Torah and the gospel, which he had access to. And chapter 5, 48, follows up, 43 to 47, because in 43, 47, it tells the Jews of Muhammad's time, judge by the Torah you have, you Christians judge by the gospel you have, and Muhammad, your book confirms what is between your hands. Well, what was between his hands? The Torah of the Jews and the gospel of the Christians. And that's further confirmed, David, by one of our favorite hadiths from Abu Dawood, Sunan Abu Dawood, which is also cited by Ibn Kathir in his exposition of chapter Chapter 5, verse 41, where Muhammad is sitting on a cushion. He visits the Jews, and the Jews tell him, <clears throat> Abu Qasim, because he had a son named Qasim. So father of Qasim, we caught two people committing adultery. So you decide what their judgment should be. Sitting on a cushion, folks. He removes the cushion, because the cushion represented the judgment seat. He goes, bring me the Torah that you have, the Torah you have. They gave him a copy of their Torah in the 7th century, it says he placed it on the cushion and he looked at the Torah and started speaking to it, David. He said, I believe in you, you Torah. I believe in you and the one who revealed you. Why is Muhammad bearing witness to the copy of the Torah in the hands of the Jews that he had access to if that Torah is corrupt? And by the way, this is the Torah that also contains instructions to fight and kill the Canaanites, which mm -hmm. Muslims often tell me is genocide, proof that the Bible's corrupted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm, I'm just confused, Sam. You, you, you've just shown that we have over and over and over again confirmation that Christians in the 7th century had 
the gospel. Again, this would mean that it had been preserved 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century, 6th century, into the 7th century. We have copies of it. We have copies of it from before, during, and after the time of Muhammad. Salmon Player says, but it just disappeared. As soon as Muhammad died, yep. all copies of the gospel across the Christian world miraculously disintegrated and were replaced by copies of some other book that even our Muslim scholars tended to point to and quote as the gospel. And so this is yeah. just amazing, right? I mean, it, what, what he's saying requires an actual miracle that 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 all copies that of the, all big... copies of the gospel were just miraculously yeah. disappeared and were replaced by other books. Yeah, and it would be a bigger miracle to say that the gospels, the <clears throat> Old Testament scriptures that Muhammad had access to, vanished out of thin air without a trace, and something totally different replaced them after his death. Yeah, that mm -hmm. would be a miracle because yep. that means yep. you'd have to gather all the member. Folks, let me just emphasize what Dave is trying to say. At the time of Muhammad, Christianity had spread all over the then world. You had Christians not just in Arabia. You had them in India. You had even Christians in China. You had Christians in Rome. For the gospel to completely vanish out of thin air, that means someone had to be able to procure all the copies in all these places all over the world, destroy them, and then replace them with something brand spanking new, and then all the Christians then forget about the gospel that they just had and be doped into following this new version that popped out of thin air. Mm -hmm. That would be a miracle. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a miracle that only Allah can perform because Allah says that no one can change his words. And yet, according to Sam and Player, Allah, uh, Allah's words in the, in the gospel around the world were miraculously changed. So Allah must have done what he said no one can do. Yeah, I'm telling you. And Paul actually, remember, corrupted Christianity. Though Allah swore that Jesus' true followers would be victorious till the day of res resurrection, mm -hmm. Paul, through a monkey wrench in Allah's plans, means Paul, Bulus Akbar. Mm -hmm. Paul is great. Yeah. And so uh, if, ever, if anyone here is new to discussions with Muslims, guess what? This isn't just Sam and Player here. Muslims are forced into some sort of position like this. Because if you're talking to a Muslim, he, he's been taught to say, oh, the gospel's been changed, or the gospel's been corrupted, or Christians don't have the gospel. You say, when? You say, oh, it was corrupted by the Apostle Paul, or it was corrupted at the, at the Council of Nicaea. They'll say something silly like that. But then you yeah. can show that according to Allah and Muhammad, Christians in the 7th century still had the gospel, right? Yeah, yeah. And that changes their position, right? Like Sam and Player, oh, they don't have it. They don't have it. He, he was going along the same lines as he was going to go. If we had asked him there what he meant, he would have said, you know, Paul corrupted it or, or, uh, or the Council of Nicaea or something like that. By the way, anyone who says Council of Nicaea has no clue what they're talking about with, with regard to Scripture. It had nothing to do with, with uh, the selection of any Scriptures. Um, so, but they'll say something like that. So once you show that according to the Quran, the Torah and the Gospel were still around yeah. in a preserved form that was still authoritative over Jews and Christians, then they have to change their position to, oh, well, it changed after that, even though we have copies before that. And so then now they have to, to posit something miraculous. It was a miracle that all copies disappeared. And you think, oh, that's so silly. That's what their religion forces them to conclude. Right. Their religion right. requires them to believe something that, that totally contradicts all of reality in order to maintain their position. Yeah. You, you know why, David, I was laughing? Hmm. There's a Christian who actually told us, <clears throat> uh, gave us how it could be possible for all the manuscripts to disappear. He said, Thanos snapped his finger. <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> hey, I need to make a video. Allah is Thanos. Sla snapped his finger, wiped them all out. Yeah. <laughs> so that, was, that was a good one, brother. <laughs> all right. Well, Sam and Player, hope you, peak, hope you keep uh, coming back. You're fun to interact with. Yeah, um, may God guide you to the truth of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Salman. Amen. We really do. We want you to get saved. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions and then get into our topic. Um, by the way, we are going to be covering this topic of Allah praying um, today. You're good tomorrow, right, Sam? Yeah, yeah. Okay. God willing, like I said, I'm good. We're going to yeah. be covering it today and tomorrow. Today we're going to look at what the sources say. So what the Quran says, um, what, the had what the Hadith say, what Muslim commentators have said. We're going to look at what the Muslim sources say. And after that, after that, so tomorrow, Lord willing, we're going to look at video clips uh, of uh, various Muslims, various uh, Arabic speaking Muslims who acknowledge what's said here. And uh, so this should should be two fun days because 
turns out, Sam, this this is a a very sensitive topic for Muslims when you when you bring it up, right? And it's funny mm. because Christians just figured out how sensitive a, a topic this is because most Christians didn't know that according to Muslim sources, Allah prays and worships, and so they never bring that up. But then they found out all of a sudden. Uh, some Muslim speakers get really sensitive when you bring this up and they have to start saying you said something you didn't say and so on to attack a straw man. Um, turns out to be a big issue. So that's why we're going to take uh, uh, two live streams to talk about it. Um, but uh, I wanted to respond to this real quick because I get this a lot. And I've, I've never asked what Sam's position is. Uh, but he says, uh, uh, wanted to get both of your opinions on Imam Tawhidi. Would yeah, you do I a talk with the Imam? Um, by the way, Dr. Wood, did you get my card? Uh, I don't know your actual name, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, to, yeah, to be quite honest, I mean, Imam Tawhid is like, he's, he's like too good to be true, so he blows my mind away with how brutally honest he is about what Sunni Islam teaches, but so, you know, I don't know much about him, but man, <laughs> let him keep rocking, because he's destroying Sunni Islam. That, that would, that would uh, be my assessment as well, right? And it, what I'm saying he, here is that, Lots of times when you see a Muslim coming out claiming to be, you know, a peaceful guy, peaceful Muslim and so on, you start noticing, well, he's not really condemning what's going on a lot. He's not really condemning a lot of the horrible things that we find in Islam. And so it's difficult to take the person seriously. But yeah. Imam Tawhidi is not like that, right? He started calling, he started going by the Imam of peace. And I'm like, oh, no, here's another one. Oh, Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance. And then, but then he starts just blasting away. I yeah, mean, he starts blasting away at things Muslims are doing and at lots of uh, Islamic teachings. So I'm inclined to trust someone more like that. So and, I, and keep in mind, I, I only know him from his tweets. Right. So I haven't watched his videos, um, haven't seen a lot. Um, but uh, so I know him mainly from his tweets. But the information, the stuff he's posting in his tweets is pretty brutal. So I, I, I'd, I'd be fine taking him pretty seriously. Um, as someone who I'm guessing, because he apparently still considers himself a Muslim, so I'm guessing that he's some sort of Quran-only Muslim or, or rejects most hadiths or something like that. Perhaps then, even is that, is, that, is that correct? I'm, he may be a Shia because yeah. he doesn't dress like a Quran-only Muslim because sometimes you see him wearing like what the Shia Muslims do. I don't know much about him, but what I've heard him say about Sunni Muslims is brutal. He like, he, like even, wow. he, even if he's a Shia, he'd have to be rejecting some major... Hadith collections in order to get it to get it peaceful peaceful views of Islam. So I don't know how he's interpreting things, but um, uh, yep. So I I take him seriously until I have reason otherwise. Um, but we'll see. Okay, that was all right. So that was his question. All right. Yep. David and Sam, Allah offers me wine and virgins in heaven. What's yes. in the heaven of Yahweh? Eternal worshiping. Sounds like slavery to me would like an honest answer now the name here is osama bin pimpin so i'm guessing this is a i'm guessing this is a joke so osama okay. bin pimpin says allah offers me wine and virgins in heaven what's in that boring heaven of, of yahweh eternal worshiping sounds like slavery to me would like an right. honest answer we got all we got all the virgins over here so I don't know. So does he really want an answer? Or he's just picking. He probably he probably want he probably wants an answer, but it doesn't sound like a, a, an entirely serious question. Yeah. Because Although they're... if if this is like an atheist or something, and he's making fun of the Islamic view of heaven, he could simultaneously be mocking the the Christian view of heaven that it's boring, right? So yeah, the Islamic but view you... is all perverted and sensual, and it's all about sex and Allah giving you an eternal erection so that you can continue deflowering virgins for all eternity and uh, as fast as you deflower these virgins Allah restores their virginity so you can keep deflowering them for all eternity that's what Islamic paradise is like y Yahweh's paradise it's all just you know boring worshiping so yeah but I mean, look at his picture too it's it's you have the picture of uh, 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 what do you call it a genie genie and a lamp, yeah. yeah he's what he's got a cigar in his mouth and a hat and you're like man he's styling and profiling man Right. I mean, I like this. Guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, the answer, I, I don't even need to answer. Well, let's, let's let's answer from the words of Scripture. If you want, David, mm -hmm. Psalm 16, 10 to 11. If you want to turn there and read, here's an answer. <clears throat> the paradise of Jehovah, the paradise of Jesus Christ. By the way, the Bible says that heaven will be on earth. 
<clears throat> is a, a dimension, a place, a state in which you will be filled with the infinite love, peace, and joy of the true God. It will be everlasting pleasures that are not sensual, that are spiritual, that will fill every cell and fabric of your being because God is the source of true joy, happiness, love, and peace. That's what awaits believers. It's not just worship. It's being in love with God and God being in love with you and fellowshipping with him and beholding infinite beauty. I mean, think about it. When you see something beauty, beautiful, don't you just get fixated at looking at it and you stand in awe at something that is so beautifully designed? Well, God is beauty. Just looking at him will fill us with such a pleasure that words cannot describe. And I'm not just making this up. Notice what Psalm 16, 10 to 11 says. Mm -hmm. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Fullness of joy, joy that words cannot describe. No more pain, no more sadness, no more misery, joy and peace. Pleasures that are not sensual, <clears throat> that are spiritual, that are delightful beyond description forever and ever and ever. One more, Revelation 21, <clears throat> verses 1 to 7. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. So can you imagine that? Being in the presence of the source of infinite peace and joy and love and beauty and basking in his presence forever and ever, being filled with such a love and joy and peace that you cannot describe, and there's nothing comparable, comparable to it on this side of eternity. It's something we're going to have to experience. We get tastes of it here and there, but when we see the fullness of it, words cannot describe it. Revelation 21, 1-7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither Notice shall there be... Go ahead. No more crying, no more pain, no more misery, no more death, right? Mm-hmm. And go and continue what else, because I want you to emphasize it, to see the promise of our God when he comes to dwell with us. <clears throat> Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who Amen. conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Wait, does it say you'll be my slave, or you will be my beloved child, mm -hmm. being filled with my love, my joy, my peace, <clears throat> and you will inherit the entire creation. It's yours, and you'll be in my presence, and you'll never know what pain is, sadness is, misery, and death will no longer separate you from your loved ones. That's the true heaven of the true God. And the final verse, David, final one. Romans 14, 17. What does Paul say? The beloved Paul, uh, the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 14, 17. So even though he may have asked it in jest, guys, notice the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will be loved by the triune God with an infinite love, flooded in their infinite love, joy and peace forever. No more pain, no more sadness, no, no more misery, no more dis disappointment, no more heartache. What better than to dwell in the presence of infinite beauty, seeing the face of Jesus and how beautiful that is and how delighted we will, we will be when we see him. Romans fourteen seventeen. <clears throat> For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Sure sounds like this is a statement against the Quran, indicting the Quran, because the Quran's paradise is all about eating and drinking, right? And what does Paul say? It's not about that. It's not saying you won't eat, but he's saying that's not the the goal of paradise. That's mm -hmm. not the culmination of of our <clears throat> walk with the Lord Jesus. Instead, it's going to be perfect justice, no more injustice, perfect love and joy in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit forever and ever, where you will never thirst 
and hunger for righteousness or justice or love and compassion. That will be all wiped out. So Sam, that's what Sam, we have to look for. Sam and players probably over here like, you see, I told you Paul corrupted Christianity. The real message that Jesus preached must have been about all the virgins you are going to get to deflower in heaven and Allah. I mean, Paul corrupted it. You're right. Paul corrupted it from being a carnal, sensual paradise that makes Playboy Mansion pale in comparison to something spiritual and pure and holy and beautiful. Yeah, man, <clears throat> if that's corruption, then you can keep your uh, incorruptible paradise. I'll take Paul's corruption any time of the day. Hugh Hefner ain't got nothing on Allah. <laughs> or his messenger. Don't forget. Hey, this actually tie this actually ties in because the passage passage in Revelation talked about um, you know, conquering through uh, people conquering through their faith. Um, Nova said, even after fourteen hundred years of hardship, Arab Christians never submitted to Islam. That's real faith for you. Um, well, some certainly did along the way, but uh, you have to have respect for people who endured persecution as a community for fourteen centuries. Um, that's across, especially in places like Egypt and so on where people have been, I mean, and really not, not, just, not even Christians, anyone who uh, was in an environment, an Islamic environment, where they endured persecution for centuries and didn't give in. Um, that's hard. That's hard because you know at any time, at any time, you can change your position in life just by going over there and reciting the Shahada, and then you'll be a hero, right? Then they'll regard you as a hero. Then they'll, yeah, put, then they'll, then they'll, put, they'll put you up on a, on, on a pedestal. And say, he, see, here, here's, the, here's the person who converted from Christianity. And they'll send you around the world. You'll have a great life. And you, as a, as a Christian in the Muslim world, know you could do that at any time. So to not do that, that's, uh, get respect for that. Amen, amen. And God preserve all the Middle Eastern Christians, not just Arabs, folks. You have also Assyrian, Chaldean, and Arab Christians who have lived under the yoke of Islam. And because of the power of the Holy Spirit... God has preserved them till this day, and many have died gladly instead of recanting Jesus for this wicked, false prophet, antichrist named Muhammad. So the Lord Jesus preserved his people in the Middle East, the Arabs, the Assyrians, and Chaldeans. And again, you guys know this, but I'm also Assyrian, not from Syria, but Assyrian. And I thank the Lord that he raised me up from the Assyrians to be a light to shine for his glory throughout the whole world to glorify Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Yeah, that is pretty cool that the Assyrians get horribly persecuted for all these centuries, and then Sam Shamoon comes out of nowhere and just starts wrecking Islam. <laughs> I think that's that's what God did. He goes, you know what? Here's 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 what I want to do for you Assyrians. I'm going to raise this big, bald, beautiful, handsome Assyrian beast, and by the power of the Spirit, he's going to do, destroy Islam. So the blood of the martyrs of my people were not shed in vain. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. You got the beast part right. All right, Sam. Well, let's get into our uh, let's get into our topic here. We uh, we wanted to talk about Allah praying and worshiping. Now, Sam, did you know that according to Muslim sources, Allah prays and worships? You wicked kafir! How dare you twist the message of Allah and His Messenger? This is why you will be plunged into the most brutal. <clears throat> torturous part of hell. You deserve it, you kafir. How dare you say Allah prays and worships? Don't you know that pray means actually bless, right, and show mercy? How many times am I going to have to tell you, you white kafir, you? Hey, now let's, let, let's, uh, let's look at Surah 33, verse 56 of the Quran, just so we can show this. Apparently, the word means just about anything except pray, right? Exactly. It means yeah. just about anything except pray. We We have this from the parenthetical comments notice how many parenthetical comments and translations uh the haleli khan edition of the quran has to put in there to try and keep people from going with the obvious implication of this verse so here we have surah 33 verse 56 of the quran they even they even put salat there right they even put this is salat verse 56 allah sends his salat and what does Salat mean? Now, this is what's interesting, Sam, because you can go up to any Arab-speaking person in the world and say, what's Salat? Or what's Salat? Prayer. Prayers. That's what it is. It's all prayer. Praying. Praying. That's what it is. Right? 
Suddenly you say, but Allah does it according to the Quran. Oh no, then you get here. Watch this. Allah sends his salat, graces, honors, blessings, mercy on the Prophet Muhammad and also his angels ask to bless and forgive him, ask Allah to bless and forgive him. Now notice, Sam, because in the actual Arabic, Allah and his angels are doing the same thing. Yes. But yes. when Allah does it, it means it means he's sending graces, but when the angels do it, even though it's the it's the same word that's used for both of them, it means they're asking something, right? They're asking Allah to do something. Yeah. yeah. So Allah and so ask Allah to bless and forgive him. Oh you who believe, send your salat. And we know what salat means for humans, right? Send yeah, your so salat on, and this means asking Allah to bless him. Muhammad, and you should greet or salute him with the Islamic way of greeting. So we have Allah, his angels, and Muslims who are all said to be doing the same thing. And yet, those things mean completely different things because Muslims don't want to acknowledge that Allah prays and worships. What do you think about this, Sam? And, and David, I want you to also highlight, and I'm sure we're going to look at other translations. You may, you may even have another for them, see? Yep. The Arabic doesn't separate Allah from the angels yep. in performing yep. this action. I want the people to know the dishonesty in this translation. <clears throat> this is a translation done by Salafi Muslims. Mm -hmm. Notice it says Allah performs Salah, and then it says the angels also perform Salah. It separates Allah from the angels in performing the act of Salah. Actually, the Arabic doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. The Arabic mm -hmm. says... Allah and his angels perform this act of salah together. Allah and his angels together pray. But they have to separate Allah from the angels because when you translate the Arabic correctly, you're going to be hard-pressed to try to redefine the term salah and reference salah if Allah is joining the angels in that action. In other words, Allah and the angels together are praying. Now, notice the admission of this translation. When angels perform salah, it's an invocation. Mm -hmm. They're praying, they're invoking Allah. When believers are asked to perform salah for Muhammad, it's an invocation to Allah to bless the Muhammad. But then when the same word is applied to Allah, in the context of Allah and the angels together as a group performing salah, now salah doesn't mean that Allah prays for Muhammad or invokes or asks someone to bless Muhammad. It simply means that Allah bestows His grace and mercy and blessing. You don't get more dishonest than this with the Arabic. Mm -hmm. And yet these are the Muslims who tell us that they fear Allah and they love His Messenger and they honor the Quran because it's the only perfectly preserved revelation of Allah. And yet notice how they butcher their very own religious text in order to avoid what the text clearly says. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of a side note, but the point you just brought up there, that... Muslims claim to love and reverence Allah and Muhammad and Jesus, and yet they'll completely massacre the words of any of them yeah. to bring them in line with their own personal beliefs. Unbelievable. And uh, and so if we if we take what Muslims say seriously, right, that what the, what Allah really meant here is that he's doing something completely different from the angels, even though they're lumped together as the subject, right? It's Allah and his angels do this thing. But the thing that's done means completely different things for Allah and the angels. It, with them, they're having to invoke Allah, but for Allah, he's not invoking anything else. Um, when they have to do this sort of thing, um, it, basically what they're telling us, if we take them seriously, is they're telling us Allah is the worst communicator in history. You better he leave. wants to say that he, he's going to send blessings. He wants to say that he sends blessings on Muhammad or that he shows mercy towards Muhammad or that he praises Muhammad. It doesn't matter. They, they'll give this all kinds of different translations. They want to say Allah was, that's what Allah really meant. Well, why did he use the word for pray? Ah, well, you know, Allah knows best. Well, he used the word for pray. So yes. if you really respect him, you should respect the word that he, he used. And when you say he was really trying to mean, he really meant this completely different thing. Then you're telling us that Allah is just a horrible communicator, right? Like he's got, yep. he's got some sort of cosmic Tourette syndrome or something like this. He keeps <laughs> blurting out the wrong words. He's trying yeah. to say one thing, but he can't get his words right. He's fumbling over his words. And uh, this is just interesting for, this is just interesting for a deity 
who constantly brags about how clear he is. My speech is so clear. It's so clear. It's fully explained, explained in detail. And I pray. And Muslims say, oh, no, he doesn't. No, no, it doesn't mean that. Come on, Arabic is expressive. That's another canard we want to refute. Mm -hmm. An Arabic word can have, you know, plethora of meanings because the Arabic language is so expressive. So it doesn't always mean this. Now, I just want to diffuse that. I want to refute that canard. Because I'll tell you, the Arabic language is a rich language. It's rich in meaning. It's very expressive. And a word can have multiple meanings. Here's the problem, folks. If they ever bring that up, here's what I want you to remember. We may have to repeat this over and over again, David, until it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. It's not so much that a word can have various meanings. First of all, a word has to be defined by the context in which it appears. But secondly, notice what we said. It's Allah and the angels performing salah together. So whatever meaning you attach to the word salah in reference to angels, that meaning has to stick when you apply it to Allah, when Allah is doing that act with them. In other words, if you're going to tell me when un angels pray, perform salah, it means an invocation, how then re are you going to redefine the term when Allah is said to be doing that act together with them? Allah and the angels are doing salah together. So the meaning has to be the same. Why all of a sudden... The meaning is different for angels, even though it's being used of angels with Allah. They're both doing the same act. How can it have a different meaning? So re be careful of that canard. Mm -hmm. Well, the word salah can mean various things. Okay, that's that's fine and dandy. In this context, where it uh, says Allah and the angels together are praying, or let's just say salah, doesn't mean pray. Please tell me what salah means when both Allah and the angels perform it. Don't tell me it means this in reference to angels, but it means something else in reference to Allah when they're doing it all together. Right? So I just want to diffuse that canard. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, did you, uh, should we go ahead and read uh, verse 43 as well? Yes, add that as well. And then I'm going to quote Edwin Palmer's interesting note, because mm -hmm. Palmer translated the Quran. Yep. He's, he's yep. since deceased, and you can actually just, you can actually uh, download his entire Quran and distribute mm -hmm. it. It's the, the copyright has expired, but that's yeah. another story. See what thirty three forty three says. He it is who sends his salat, and here and this is referring to Allah. Allah it is who sends his salat, and yeah. uh, we have in parentheses here his blessings. Now notice why include this uh, little translation here, right? Why why not just one? Why not just translate the word? And two, if you don't want to translate the word, you're assuming that people know what the word is. So why not just let people understand what Salat is? Well, because any person who's reading this, who knows anything about Islam, is going to read that and immediately say, wait, Allah does Salat? That's yes. prayer. Right? So he it is who sends Salat, his blessings on you. And his angels, too, ask Allah to bless and forgive you. Notice, now it's they ask Allah. So yes. here for the angels, it means invocation that he may bring you out from darkness of disbelief and polytheism into light of belief yep. and Islamic monotheism. And he is ever most merciful to the yep. believers. Now, David, before we get <clears throat> into the meaning of Salah again in reference to Allah and the angels, mm -hmm. I want you to understand what this passage is saying, because sometimes we get so hung up on the term Salah that we forget the implication of this passage mm -hmm. and shows that Allah either is a schizophrenic being or he has to answer to other gods greater than him. What do I mean? Guys, understand why Allah performs salah. I'm going to translate his prayer. Guys, see why Allah prays. Let me translate it accordingly. He it is who prays for you, you meaning all Muslims here, and so do the angels. Why does he pray? That he may bring you out from darkness into light. Now, David, for the life of me, why does Allah need to pray to bring you out of darkness? Why can't he just bring you out of darkness? Mm -hmm. Do you understand the implication yeah. of why he prays? He's praying to lead you out of darkness. Mm -hmm. Now, I can understand why the angels would pray to Allah. Oh, Allah, lead David out of darkness into the light of Islam. Okay, I understand that. I can understand me praying to Allah to bring you out of darkness into the light of Islam because light here is Islam. Why does Allah need to pray to do that? So Allah is going to say, Oh Allah, please bring David out of darkness into light. Okay, David, now I'm going to bring you out of darkness into light because I just asked myself to do it. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and by the way, the, uh, in case anyone wonders why this is such an important point, uh, 
if you interact, if you're a Christian and you interact with Muslims, you get this all the time. Well, if Jesus is God, how can you believe that he prays? Right. In fact, someone brought it up here. A Muslim yeah. brought it up in response to us. Well, Jesus prayed to the Father. He brought it up. Really? <laughs> yeah, in the comment section. That's awesome. So, no, that, that's, that's absolutely perfect, right? Uh, yes, we agree that it would be a huge problem for Jesus to pray to God if Jesus is God and if we have a Unitarian understanding of God, that God is one in nature, essence, or being, and one in person. There we would have to wonder, well, how is Jesus praying? But we're Trinitarians who also believe in the incarnation, namely that God exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that the divine eternal Son entered creation as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, if you have the Son in creation with a human nature, will he continue his eternal relationship that he has had with the Father? Or will he suddenly become an atheist, as James White has asked? Would you expect him to become an atheist or to continue speaking to the Father as he's done for all eternity? Which one would he do? Obviously, he's going to continue that eternal relationship he's had with the Father. How is he going to do that once he has a human nature? Well, you would do that through prayer. So you can say you don't believe in any of that. You can say you don't believe in the Trinity. You can say that you don't believe in the Incarnation. What you can't do with a straight face, if you have any integrity, is say, well, that makes no sense in, in light of Christian theology, right? If Christian theology is correct, in other words, if God is a trinity and we do have the incarnation, Jesus would have to pray. Jesus would have to pray to communicate with the Father. That, that's, that's how that would work. So you can't say that, that that refutes Christian theology. You'd have to refute Christian theology in another way. But it's Muslims themselves who have acknowledged that if you have a Unitarian concept of God, Obviously, God can't be praying because that would mean he's either praying to himself or he's praying to someone who's greater than himself. So our question for the Muslims is, your God says he prays in his perfectly yep. clear word. Who's he praying to? Is he talking to himself? Is he saying, oh, Allah, please help these people out of darkness? Or is he talking to someone greater? Is this is this a leftover remnant from the pagan and polytheism of Muhammad's time, that you had this pantheon of gods and Muhammad just incorporated this because maybe the gods are talking to other gods or something like this. And he didn't realize what he was incorporating. He did that very often a lot with practices and so on. He did a lot with, with uh, teachings he was stealing from Judaism and Christianity. Namely, they just became part of his religion because they were, he, they were in his head from hearing them so much. He put them in the Quran and didn't realize the implications and ran into a lot of theological problems later for doing so. Is it like that, or is Allah praying to himself? Is Allah praying to someone else, or is he praying to himself? That's what yeah. we have to know. And so what you have to do, of course, is you're going to deny that he prays, and so you have to say that Salah means something else. And there are going to be some problems with that, because you're going to have to give us another translation, and when you do that, you're going to be in trouble here. Is that you right, Jerry? Yeah, because in fact, because again, notice that the angels are performing Salah, because again, in the Edward Henry Palmer translation, and I want to read him for a reason, because he has an interesting note. Guys, pay attention, <clears throat> not just to the verse, but to the note by Palmer. I'm going to read his translation. And by the way, of all the translations that we have on our Quran browser that's attached to the Answering Islam website, we don't have many, but the ones we do, he's the only one who translated his prey, and <clears throat> because he's correct. Notice how he renders 33.43. He it is who prays for you and his angels too. So notice again, Allah is performing an action that the angels also engage in. I want to sound like a broken record. I want this to sink in, folks. Allah is doing this and the angels are doing it. You can't tell me the word all of a sudden means something different when it's used of Allah and then when it's used of angels. So that when Allah performs Salah, it means something different than when angels do it. Because the verse is saying they're both doing it. Angels with Allah are performing salah. The meaning has to be consistent. Now that's why Edward Henry Palmer rendered it as pray. He it is who prays for you and his angels too. Now notice his footnote. And here's my challenge to all the Muslims that are listening and all the Muslim polemicists. I'm going to read the footnote and I'm going to issue the challenge. Notice what he says. The same word is used as is rendered pray in all the other passages in the Quran. Let me repeat again. This word salah, every time it appears in the Quran, always means pray. 
The same word is used as is rendered pray in all the other passages in the Quran. Though the commentators interpret it here as meaning bless, so too in the formula which is always used after Muhammad's name, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may God bless and preserve him, is literally, and I love his honesty here because he knew the Arabic, may God pray for him and salute him. So here's my challenge to all the Muslims and Christians. I want you to challenge them to show a single place in the entire Quran where this verb salah is used and it does not mean pray. Every time this word is used in the entire Quran, it only has one meaning, pray. And yet when this word is used of Allah performing this action with angels, all of a sudden it doesn't mean that anymore. Mm -hmm. There you go. Now, uh, we do want to uh, address some of the alternative translations, but I, I just wanted to point out yes. that there are um, hadith translators, Muslim hadith translators, who simply translate uh, passages that refer to Allah praying as Allah praying. And that is, uh, that's good. They're acknowledging what the word is, and they're going to let interpreters try and figure out what's going on here, but they at least acknowledge that Allah prays. Yep. As you read it, Dave, I'm going to stick away okay. for just one okay. second. Just go ahead and read this for us. One second. Okay. So uh, I'm going to read. Uh, this is from Riyadh as salahin and this is translated by Aisha Buli. Number 1387, Abu Umama reported that the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, Allah and his angels and the people of the heavens and the earth, even the ants in their rocks and the fish, pray for blessings on those who teach people good. They all pray for blessings on those who teach people good. So notice here, here it's all of these different groups and categories here, Allah and the angels and the people of the heavens and the earth, even the ants in their rocks and the fish, pray for blessings on those who teach people good. So what our friends here are going to say once again is, well, it means something completely different. The verb that is used of what everyone is doing here means pray for everything else. But for Allah, it doesn't mean pray. It means he just sends blessings. And so yep. uh, they certainly have to do with there. Now, one more. This is from uh, Al-Hadith Al-Qudsiyah. Number 216. The Israelites said to Musa, does your Lord pray? Now notice, this is a pretty straightforward question, right? Does your Lord pray? Musa said, Fear Allah, O sons of Israel. Allah said, O Musa, what did your people say? Musa said, O my Lord, you already know. They said, Does your Lord pray? Now think about this. Go, go, back, go back to the beginning there. So the Israelites said to Moses, Hey, does God pray? And he just says, Fear Allah. Fear Allah. Hey, don't be asking me questions like that. So he goes back to Allah and Allah says, hey, what, what did your people ask? And his response is, you already know. They said, does your Lord pray? Does God pray? And Allah said, tell them my prayer for my servants is that my mercy should precede my anger. If it were not so, I would have destroyed them. So notice Sam here. I mean, we have Allah already already praying. Yeah, well. In the Quran that, he, you know, he's going to, to lead us out of darkness. He, he prays that we will be led from darkness to light. And yes. here, something similar, except he's, he's praying about himself. He prays that his mercy will triumph over his wrath. So he's kind of praying for self-control. Yeah. And so yeah. who, is he, who is he praying to? Is he praying to himself for self-control or is he praying to someone else? Is he saying, oh, you, God, who's above me? Please, please help me not wipe these people out. Please, please, please let my mercy triumph over my wrath. Or is he praying to himself saying, oh, self, oh, self. Yes. I pray to you that your <laughs> awesome mercy will triumph over the wrath by which you want to slaughter all these people. Um, which one? Well, but he's praying, right? Well, you can make a strong case. He's praying to himself mm -hmm. because the Quran does say that Allah is a nafs. Nafs meaning soul. In chapter 5, verse 116, right? In 117, when you read, Jesus supposedly says to Allah, you know, you know what is in my soul, nafs. I don't know what's in your soul. So he may be praying to himself, oh, nafs, nafsi, my soul, 
please have mercy upon my creatures. Hey, possibly. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I, <laughs> what do you want me to tell you? Yeah. Like, like David said, as a Trinitarian, we have no problem three distinct persons can have fellowship, communion, and love one another and speak to one another. And Jesus as man, as the perfect man, man as God intended man to be, offer up perfect prayers to the Father where the Father always answers the Son. But Allah is supposedly unipersonal. Mm -hmm. Who in the world does he pray to when he prays for anyone? Well, if you're going to say he's praying to someone else, then he's not the only God, or there are other persons that exist with him in his essence, or he's praying to his own soul. Mm -hmm. You you don't have too many options, Muslims. And the one option you don't have is to say, well, it doesn't mean pray, because we're going to decimate that argument by your own sources, by the grace of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and why don't we go ahead and uh, turn to that now, Sam, because yes. the, there are lots of different translations, and people can even go to Ibn Kathir, and they'll see how different Muslims tried to translate this differently. Now, now just think about this. Why would, why would so many different Muslims need to come up with completely different translations of this word? And the reason is because the word means prayer. So if you're going to say it means something else, you can just make up whatever you want, right? You, right. Can, say, you can say, oh, it means makes pancakes for <clears throat> Allah makes pancakes for the prophet. You can say anything you want, right? You can just make something up. And so that's why they'll say, oh, it means shows mercy. Oh, it means praises. Oh, it means sends blessings. Those are those are very different things. And yeah. Muslims will translate it as all of those different things. Why? 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 Why are they coming up with all these translations? Because they're translating a word that doesn't mean any of those things. Precisely. And they're just giving it a translation they want to avoid the actual translation, which is praise. So, Sam, do you want to go go over some yes. of these alternatives and show why Muslims who appeal yes. to one of these alternatives yes. uh, run into now, some problems? Now, I'm going to quote Muslim sources affirming the word salah. And there's another word used of Allah praying, it's salawat, which is in another verse we'll look at in a moment. Mm-hmm. Some Muslims, as David just alluded to, will say, well, salah means that Allah blesses. Well, number one, there is an Arabic word for bless, it's barakah. I'm going to now read to you the prayers that Muslims offer to Allah when they ask Allah to bless Muhammad and his family. Because in the prayers, they distinguish between Allah Salah and his Barakah. They distinguish between Allah performing Salah for Muhammad and Allah blessing Muhammad his Barakah. Guys, let me read this to you. This, By the way, this is what Muslims pray five times a day. This is part of their prayers. Let me read. This comes from Ibn Kathir. The subheading is the command to say Salah upon the Prophet. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip to the relevant part. <clears throat> Here it says, Al-Bukhari recorded that Kab bin Ujra said, It was said, O Messenger of Allah, with regard to sending Salam upon you, Salam means peace. We know about this, but how about Salah? How do we pray for you? Now notice he's asking, how do we do Salah for you? How do we pray for you? He said, Folks, pay attention. Say, O oh Allah, send your salah upon Muhammad and upon the family Muhammad as you sent your salah. And by the way, these are the Muslim translators. They translated this way. Send your salah upon the family of Ibrahim. Verily, you are the most praiseworthy, most glorious. O oh Allah, send your blessings upon Muhammad and upon the family of Muhammad as you sent your blessings upon the family of Ibrahim. Verily you are the most praiseworthy. Let me read another one. Say, O oh Allah, folks pay attention. This is in their prayers for Muhammad when they pray five times a day. O oh Allah, send your salah upon Muhammad and upon the family Muhammad as you sent your salah upon the family of Ibrahim. Verily you are the most praiseworthy, most glorious. O oh Allah, send your blessings upon Muhammad, upon the family of Muhammad as you sent your blessings upon the family of Ibrahim. Now, David, did you catch it? Yep. yep. They're asking Allah to send his salah and barakah. Yep. Allah, send your salah and your barakah upon Muhammad and his family as you did Ibrahim and his family. So how in the world can a Muslim with a clear face tell us salah, prayer means Allah blesses when in their prayers, and they know this, by the way, Muslims know this. They invoke Allah to send his salah along with his barakah, his prayers with his blessing, showing they cannot mean the same thing. Otherwise, they're being redundant. So they're basically trying to tell us that what they're really saying is, Allah, send your salah, and again, Allah, send your salah. 
or Allah send your blessing, and again, Allah send your blessing. So this prayer in itself refutes the lie that Allah Salah means he blesses. No, he does both. He sends his Salah upon Muhammad and his Barakah, his blessing upon Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So now <clears throat> that's one. Now if you want me to give another, I will. But no, if you I, want I, just, I just want to make sure that, that everyone understands the point, right? So the Quran says, and, and the Quran and the Hadith say that Allah prays. Allah does his Salah. And when we point this out, the most common Muslim response is, oh, when it says Allah prays, it means he sends blessings. That's what they say, right? And so our, our, our immediate question is, well, why didn't he use the word for blessing, which is barakah? Why did he use the word for prayer when he really meant blessing? And they say, oh, well, that's just how Allah says it. But Sam's quoting passages where it refers to these things as two different things. It refers to Allah's salah and his barakah as two different things that Allah does. And they're asking him to do these two different things. So according to Muslim sources, those are not the same thing. Prayer and blessing are not the same thing. So Muslims who say that they are, are either ignorant or they're being deceptive, right? Because it, it, they don't mean the same thing according to Muslim sources. So it's just absurd to say they mean the same thing when according to Muslim sources, they don't mean the same thing. So that's the point. Yeah, and I'm going to give further confirmation by another source that I actually heard in one of the lectures of Hamza Yusuf. He recommended this book, and that's why I went and found the book, thankfully. It's translated in English. Hamza Yusuf, who's considered one of the greatest Sunni scholars, and he's actually a North American convert to Islam. He, he said that every Muslim has to have this book in their library. It's Kadi Iyad, and it's available in English. Kadi Iyad, Musa al-Yasubi. The English translation is Muhammad, Messenger of Allah, Ash-Shifa of Kadi Iyad, translated by the same woman whose Quran you, or Hadith you, you just read from. Aisha Abdurrahman Buley, right? This comes from this source recommended by one of the greatest North American Muslim scholars. Notice what he says about the difference between prayer and blessing. Allah makes the merit of his prophet clear by first praying blessing on himself, <clears throat> and then by the prayer of the angels, and then by commanding his slaves to pray blessing and peace on him as well. Let me catch, let me repeat that translation. I don't know if you caught it. Allah makes the merit of his prophet clear by first praying Blessing on himself. So Allah prays to bless himself. That's how she translates this. Mm -hmm. And then by the prayer of the angels, and then by commanding his slaves to pray, blessing and peace on him as well. Now watch this. Abu Bakr ibn Furaq related that one of the ulama interpreted the words of the, prayer, uh, the prophet, the coolness of my eye is in the prayer, as meaning Allah's prayer, that Allah's messenger is soothed by the fact that Allah prays for him. And that of the angels and that of his community in response to Allah's command unto the day of rising. The prayer of angels and men is supplication for him and that of Allah is mercy. Now watch this. It is said, now he's responding to what some Muslims were saying. It is said that they pray means they invoke blessing, barakah. Guys, watch what the Muslim says. However, when the prophet taught people to pray on himself, which I just read, he made a distinction between the words salah and barakah. Did you catch it? Mm -hmm. The Muslim scholar said that some people say that Allah Salah means barakah, blessing. But then he appeals to Muhammad commanding his followers to pray for him. And he says in that command, he distinguished Allah from barakah. So they don't mean the same thing. In fact, the second paragraph confirms it. Watch this. The Prophet made a distinction between Salah and barakah in the hadith in which he taught about making the prayer on him. Notice, David, mm -hmm. this indicates that they have two separate meanings. But, but, two. Sam, but Sam, Muslims today are using as their main defense against the, the claim that Allah prays that the two terms mean the exact same thing. Wait, so you mean Qadi Iyad, who cites Muhammad, his own prophet, as an authority, Stating that Muhammad distinguished between Salah and Barakah, prayer and blessing, so they can't have the same meaning. Qariyah didn't know what he's talking about, though he's quoting Muhammad. So Muhammad doesn't know? So again, they know more than Muhammad? Mm -hmm. Okay. They must. They must. Hey, hey, check this out, Sam. We have, a, uh, we have a comment here that fits in really well right now. Muhammad Qasib al-Badi says, David Wood, you need to study Arabic grammar. So Sam, <laughs> if we just understood <laughs> Arabic grammar. Yes. Uh, all of this would be made clear, right? Now, keep in mind, who are we quoting here, right? Yes. 
Yes. Right. We, we, we said we're sitting here quoting Muslim sources and we have even Muslim translators, professional Muslim translators. In fact, some of the top Muslim translators in the world translating passages as Allah prays. And then the Muslim ones say, oh, you know, if you just understood Arabic grammar, you'd understand that Salah, when used of Allah, means sends blessings. And then you're sitting there quoting Muslim scholars, Muslim authorities saying it can't mean that. It can't mean that. So yeah. no, 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 notice how silly this is, right? Yeah. Notice how silly this is. Uh, oh, you know, if you just studied Arabic, what, what, what's going to happen? What, what if what if what if we spent the next 50 years studying Arabic grammar? Would we suddenly find out that Salah doesn't mean prayer, Sam? Is that what we're going to find out? Is that we're going to only, find out when we go study this? Only if we are deceivers whose consciences are seared and want to hide the facts from other people. But if we're honest to God, the only like, again, let me repeat my challenge to the gentleman. Show me a single verse in the Quran where the word Salah or Salawat does not mean prayer. Go ahead. And then when I quote Qadi Iyad, and by the way, just to, to reinforce it, notice who Qadi Iyad is going to quote to further prove that Salah is not the same as blessing or mercy. <clears throat> this is Qadi Iyad again. <clears throat> and by the way, for those of you who want these quotations, they're in my articles. And Lord willing, I'll try to send David the links so you can go and read these quotations for yourself and then use them in your witness. This again is Qadi Iyad. David, watch what he says. Salama al-Kindi said, Ali. Ali is important, I think, mm -hmm. right? Kind of. Used to teach us the prayer and the prophet as follows. Watch. Oh Allah, the one who spread out the flat expanses and created the heavens. Bestow. Now this is Aisha Buley's translation. Bestow your noble prayers. There's the word prayers. Your increased blessing. There's the word blessing. And compassion. Wow. Salah, Baraka, Rahma, all used. And they don't mean the same thing. Of your tenderness upon Muhammad, your prayers, your blessing, your compassion. Now watch this. This is from Ibn Masood, another important gentleman, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Notice what Ibn Masood says, folks. Ibn Masood used to say, when you bless the Prophet, then make the prayers on him excellent. You do not know. Perhaps it will be shown to him. Say, watch this. Oh Allah, bestow your prayers, your mercy, and your blessing. On the master of the messengers. Wait, wait, wait. Your prayers, your mercy, your blessing. But David, Muslims keep telling me Allah Salah means his mercy and or his blessing. Doesn't Ibn Masud know that? Know that? Who knows Arabic? Who's one of the four people that Muhammad said learned the Arabic Quran from? Mm -hmm. And yet he, he sees that Allah's prayers are different from his mercy and different from his blessing. So invoke Allah to bestow all three, his prayers, his mercy, and his blessing. So how can it mean the same thing? Got a problem here. <laughs> how can it mean the same thing? By the way. Hey, well, go, go ahead. No, I was going to say, do you, uh, I don't know if you have the correct translation of 2157. Most translations don't translate it correctly. This is another case where the word prayer is used, salawat, and it's used in conjunction with rahmah, because some Muslims will tell you, David, Mm -hmm. Oh, his prayer means his mercy. Well, can I read this? Mm -hmm. 2157? Yeah. Now, folks, you're going to have to know a little bit of Arabic or find an honest translator who honestly translates the Arabic terms. Here's chapter 2, verse 157. Watch this. There are those on whom are the prayers, salawat, that's another word for pray, salawat from their Lord and mercy, rahma. So notice Allah's prayers and his mercy are bestowed upon those whom Allah has guided. So here's the verse in the Quran where salawat does not mean the same thing as mercy, as rahmah. How much more evidence do we need to muster before even Muslims admit, okay, all right, salah, salawat cannot mean mercy, rahmah, or barakah, or blessing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can give more, but how much more until they say, uncle? Yeah, uh, apparent, apparently no amount, right? And... The, the funny thing here is, again, you can go up to any Muslim or any Arabic speaker in the world and say, what does Salah mean? What, what, what's it mean? It means prayer. Then you point to these verses and suddenly, no, it doesn't mean prayer at all. It means these other things. And then as Sam just showed, you go to Muslim sources where Muslim authorities 
even going back to the companions of Muhammad himself, and Muhammad himself said, no, that's not, it can't mean that. It can't mean that other thing because there's a distinction between Allah's Salah and His mercy and His blessings. They're different things, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. And so... And, uh, I don't know if you remember this, David. Uh, we won't mention the sister's name. Mm -hmm. A while back, we went to try to answer the objections of a young young lady who converted to Islam. Glory yep. to God. By the way, good news. She's a believer now. Yep. She's given her life to Jesus Christ. Now, we won't mention too many details. But in that exchange, there was a Muslim man present. We mentioned Allah praying. And he said no. He said, I don't know if you remember this. I remember the clearest days. I like remember yesterday. that discussion. He said no, it means blessing. She chimed in. Uh -huh. She chimed in and said, no, 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 you're incorrect. Because when we pray our five daily prayers... We ask Allah to send his prayers and his blessing on Muhammad and his family. They don't mean the same thing. She refuted him yeah. by appealing to the same prayer that Muhammad commanded all Muslims to say upon him. Yep. She refuted him. And, yeah, and, and uh, in that same conversation, when you pointed out that uh, Muslims speak to Muhammad in their prayers, she also said, oh, yeah, we, say, we do say that. Yes. That Muslims speak directly to Muhammad during their prayers. So that was and just, cool. And that's why and, and, and that's why I didn't believe that she was going to stay in Islam, right? There's a there's a tendency that once you become a Muslim, say anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid the argument that's being used against Islam. And she didn't have that tendency. She was using some some arguments that she'd that she'd been reading and stuff like that. But when you actually showed her evidence or facts, she acknowledged it. And so that's why yeah, that's why it uh, didn't look like she was gonna uh, remain a Muslim. And let's let's again repeat what we said. She's no longer a Muslim, folks. She's now in love with Jesus and worshiping Jesus as her Lord and Savior. So praise God, she came out, and many more will come out by the grace of God's Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, there's a there's a couple of comments over here um, on on the Arabic. Uh, let, let let me give this one, which is kind of off topic, but since there's so much issue with the with the Arabic over here, it's kind of a good it's kind of a a good little introduction here. Muhammad Rahim, Isa is just Arabic for Jesus, and Yeshua is his Hebrew name. Now, I'm, I'm pointing this out because the Muslims are over here trying to school everyone on Arabic. So let's, let's find out whether we need to be careful, whether we need to be careful when they're telling us things. So, uh, it, Sam, is this correct? Isa is just Arabic for Jesus, and Yeshua is his Hebrew name? Absolutely incorrect when it comes to the Arabic, even Arabic speaking Christians. Don't take my word for it. The Arabic form of Jesus' Hebrew name, Yeshua, and, and Arabic is Yeshua. Yeshua. And there are Arabic speaking Christians that will confirm it. So why in the world did Muhammad call him Isa? Well, to this day, that's a mystery. I mean, there are various theories that and various and scholars. It's a, it's a mystery according to Muslims themselves, according to Muslim commentators themselves, right? Yeah, yeah, because the Arabic form is Yeshua, something that's common. Now, some scholars will tell you, well, he picked it up from the Aramaic Isha. No. Others will say that he may have picked it up by Jews who are mockingly calling Jesus Isa, the rejected, accursed brother of Jacob, his twin brother. And ironically, David, mm -hmm. since Salman, I don't know if he's still here, swears by Ahmad Didad. Folks, I want you to Google Ahmad Didad's booklet, Christ in Islam. In that booklet, Ahmad Didad, claims that Isa of the Quran, Jesus' Arabic name, corresponds to the Hebrew word Esau. And he quotes Genesis to prove it. So Ahmad Didat admitted, mm -hmm. admitted that Isa in the Quran is the Arabic equivalent of Isa, the Hebrew word used in Genesis for Jacob's twin brother. He admits it, mm -hmm. but he doesn't realize that in saying that, he pretty much refuted himself and the Quran because Jesus' Hebrew name is Yeshua, and Arabic corresponding to it is Yeshua. So I didn't make that up. Your great scholar, one of the greatest scholars Islam has ever known, Ahmed Didad, made that assertion. Yeah, and Sam, Sam by the way, wouldn't that be absolutely ridiculous? What, what first or second century B.C. or A.D. Jewish mother or father would Precisely. name a kid Esau. They didn't. They stopped using it because of because of Esau, right? Precisely. Yeah. yeah. And why? We, yeah, yeah. Because Esau, they saw, was a thorn in the side of, or the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, which is why Malachi one two to three says, "Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated." Which we can explain what it means and what it doesn't mean. But the fact is, no God fearing Jew would dishonor his son 
or her son by calling him the name of someone rejected and accursed by God, Esau. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so much for that. Yeah. So, so just to be clear, the, the Arab-speaking Muslims on the side are trying to correct everyone's understanding of Arabic, and then they say Isa is just Arabic for Jesus. That's false, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. That's false. Yeah. Uh, Arab Arab-speaking Christians do not refer to Jesus as Isa, right? But, Dave, I'm laughing because, as you said that, someone said Isa is a Greek name. <laughs> that's why That's why I, I just – wait, wait, wait. That's why I shut down for a second. Rainbow Dash said Isa is a Greek name. Really? No. The Hebrew form of Jesus' name is Yeshua. The Greek word is Isus. Mm -hmm. Aramaic mm -hmm. is Isho, which does not correspond to Isa. The Arabic is Yeshua. Yeshua in Arabic, Isho in Aramaic. Jesus in Greek, Yeshua in Hebrew. I mean, okay, but that's why I shut down from yeah. seriously. I, I was about to just like completely go offline. Yeah. Computer shut down when I read Asa is Greek. Yeah, and this is to me. And and for those of you who don't understand that the point here, wouldn't we expect Allah to know what Jesus' name is? Precisely. Right. I mean, it, again, there there is speculation as to why Jesus in the Quran is referred to as Isa. Um. But the the possibilities the, the the possibilities that are actually believable, they're believable if you take the if you believe that the Quran is is ultimately derived from Muhammad and not from God, right? If it's from yeah. Muhammad, I can understand Muhammad. He's around more Jews than he was around Christians, right? So if Muhammad's walking around Jews and there was some sort of seventh century group of Jews who referred to Jesus in order to insult him and mock him by calling him Esau. And so Muhammad heard Jews referring to Jesus as Isa and thinks that that's what his name is and then includes it in the Quran. I can understand that. I don't understand Allah not knowing what Jesus' name is. I don't understand how Allah would not know what his name is and what the correct Arabic trans, uh, translation or transliteration is. I don't understand how that could be. You could go to any random Christian in the Middle East. They know what the Arabic word for Jesus is. They know what the Arabic word for Yeshua is. They know that. Allah doesn't. And <clears throat> the Muslims in the comment section are, aha, let us explain Arabic to you. You guys yeah. don't even know what the Arabic word for Jesus is. Exactly. And you're misleading people. Why would you be misleading people here? And you know what, uh, David, to even show you how, how silly it gets, I don't know if the Christians know this. You know this. I'm preaching the choir. Elijah, his mm -hmm. Hebrew name is Eliyahu, my God is Yah. In the Greek, it's Elias, because in the Greek, they add S's to the Hebrew names, mm -hmm. because we know that Greek is an inflective language. So if you want to show whether a word is the subject or the object, you have to change the form of the word. So Elias, nominative, it, you, know, you get that anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, you would think Arabic, which is a Semitic language, would use the Arabic form of the Hebrew name for Elijah, which is Eliyahu. Folks, guess what Elijah is called in the Quran? El Yas, E L Y A S. El Yas, and in one place, Muhammad even calls him El Yasin, I N, El Yasin. For the life of me, how do you get <clears throat> El Yas from Eliyahu? Where when El in the Arabic doesn't correspond to the Hebrew word for God, Ian. And yet here, Elijah is called Elias, and then he's also called Eliasin, which makes no sense and doesn't correspond to his Hebrew name. So Muslims help us out, because remember, the Quran is eternal, it's uncreated, and unless you don't believe it eternally exists as, as Arabic, that means you're telling me that in eternity, Allah gave or name Jesus Isa and Elijah Elias in eternity before creation. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm ready to take shahada. How about you? All right. All right, here we go. Uh, Sam, I think we should just go ahead and, and let one of these uh, Muslims who are trying to educate everyone go ahead and educate us, right? Because uh, Muhammad here says, Guys, when Arabic-speaking guy listen to this conversation, he dies from laughing. So... <laughs> All right. Arabs who hear that Salah mean hear us saying that Salah means prayer. Ha! They just crack up laughing. Well, no, they don't. And, and tomorrow, when we actually look at video clips, we're going to show um, Muslims acknowledging over and over again, like a beating drum, that the word means prayer. That Allah 
that Allah prays, according to the Quran. We're going to see that. Um, even even Muhammad Hijab himself admits that Salah means Dua. Right? Yes. So we're, we're going to see that. that. And, and, and then, so it's not a case of Muslims actually laughing at the things we're saying about the Arabic. It's that they believe that by laughing or pretending that they're laughing, that others will fall for it, right? That if, if someone says something and they just go, ha, 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 that's so silly, that's so ridiculous, that they don't have to actually address the point, right? Yeah. But yeah. we're going to go ahead and give Muhammad here an opportunity. Tell us what the word means there. Surah 33, verse 56 of the Quran, which says that Allah and his angels do something in Arabic. They do their salah. What does it mean? Give us the translation right now. Use your Arabic expertise. We'll wait in the comment section. Everyone slow down if you can, because um, I don't want to miss Muhammad here. Yep. His most recent comment is, David, you are the only one who is trying to deceive people here. Cool. So he acknowledges that Sam isn't the one who's trying to deceive people. So he's acknowledging that you are being honest, Sam. He said, David, you are the only one who is trying to deceive people here. So right. the, 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 the Christians in the comment section aren't. And Sam Shamoon is it? So we just we have that from from Muhammad here. But Muhammad, well, give us the translation. What is it that Allah does? That well, Allah and His angels together do in Surah 33, verse 56. You said that any Arabic speaker would know how silly and stupid we're being. They would laugh at us. Well, enlighten us. Enlighten us. Right? We're open. We're open. We're, 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 our arguments against Islam, we have tons of them. We have tons of devastating arguments against Islam. We don't need this. We don't need this. If you correct this, we, we don't have to stand our ground and say, no, you're wrong. Just show us what it means, and we'll acknowledge that, and we won't use it again. Yep, go ahead. Is he going to comment? You just gave him several minutes. I don't see anything. Coming. Yeah, and, and I, I, I know people are seeing it because people are, are asking him to respond. Yeah. Okay, come on, my friend. We're giving you the time to shine. You're 15 minutes of fame. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. It's, I mean, come on, it's one word, right? Can Muhammad translate one word for us with his excellent knowledge of Arabic? That's right. So forget the fact that Qadiyad, Ibn Masud, Ali, his own prophet, distinguished the word Salah from Baraka, and in the case of the others, even from Rahma mercy. So it can't have those meanings. Forget that. They're all wrong. We're wrong. Go ahead, my friend. Educate us, because I think you're actually the seal of prophethood. You were sent to complete and perfect what Muhammad failed to complete and perfect. Chirp. 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 <laughs> they're, 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 still, they're still telling him to respond. Now, we, we, could, we could go on, but I actually want him to respond. Tell us what the word means. So we actually have something to work with. He said that, that people would laugh. You, you, you can't laugh at everything we're saying, right? Because sometimes we're just reading. We're just reading what your scholars have said. So you can't laugh at that. We're, we're, we're quoting your scholars to you. So the only, the only admitted, input we're having. What? Did he give it to us? He just said, pray means salah. He just said it. <laughs> Wait, so pray, pray means said, salah. Pray equals salah. But Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his messenger. That's all he said. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, my goodness. Let me see. Yeah, he said, I just said, he goes, pray equals Salah. So he admitted. <laughs> I'm serious. You didn't see it? I just looked at it. Oh, no, no. Let me find this. You can't make this stuff up, man. So he just admit we're right. But then his argument is, but Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his messenger. So he's praying to himself. Oh, oh, I got it. You got it? Post it. Right. I want to see. So I pray equals Salah. He but it is very clear that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, is the messenger of Allah. So notice, notice what we, notice what we've pointed out here, ladies and gentlemen. We said, hey, according to the Quran, Allah does salah, right? And according to the Hadith, Allah does salah. And we say, hey, that means prayer, as any Arabic speaker on the planet can tell you, right? Salah means prayer. And the Muslims over in the comment section, over in the chat, say, ha ha, we laugh at your silly translation. So we sit there and stop. I mean, we literally stopped talking and said, give us the translation. We're waiting. And the response is, ha ha, I will refute you. Pray equals Salah. Salah equals pray. The two are the exact same word, just different languages. But right. it's very clear that there's no God but Allah. So we have to say, if 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 there's no God but Allah, 
and Allah prays that he is praying to himself. That's right. Because remember, there's no God but Allah, so he's got to be praying to himself. So, guys, you had a Muslim who couldn't <clears throat> deny the avalanche of evidence and candidly admitted, yes, pray equals salah. And yet, still, there is no God but Allah. Allah is the only God, and Muhammad is his messenger. So end of story. I'm done. All right, I just right. destroyed hold, you, Kafirs. Hold up, Sam. Let's just go through some of the comments. We have from Emmanuel Shahid. Ha, 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 ha. We yeah. have from Rainbow Dash. This is hilarious. Yes. We have from Chick UK. Lol, busted. <laughs> some of these I can't <laughs> post because they're a little meaner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They can read them for themselves, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. All right. I mean, at least we have him admit we're right. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ for that. He couldn't refute the avalanche of evidence from his own sources. The Quran, the Hadith, Muslim scholars admitting Salah, Salawat. In fact, David, as you're looking at comments, let me uh -huh. just read uh -huh. another Muslim source. This is from... <clears throat> <clears throat> Let me see that. Yeah, this has come from the website and understanding Islam. Okay, guys, here's a. This is a Muslim source. Let me read what he quotes. <clears throat> Ibn al athir And by the way, we will provide links because someone's asking David, mm -hmm. where are these quotes from? Where can we get these quotes? Yeah. We promise we're going to provide the links to all this material because we want you to now use it for the glory of Christ. Notice what this Muslim source says. Ibn al athir in his highly acknowledged dictionary of the Arabic language. And Nihaya fi Gharib al Athar or Athar has explained Salah as follows. This is a standard Muslim dictionary, folks. How does he translate Salah? Folks, pay attention. Al Salah and Al Salawat used for a particular kind of worship. Used for a particular kind of worship. Its literal origin is supplication, prayer. Sometimes Salah is referred to by mentioning any one or more of its parts. It is also said that the literal origin of the word is to glorify. And the particular worship is called Salah because it entails the glorification of the Lord. Wow. This is in a highly acclaimed Muslim dictionary, the Arabic by Ibn al athir Folks, understand what this means. If Salah, the literal origin is supplication and glorify... That means Allah is supplicating someone and glorifying Muhammad when he performs Salah for Muhammad as well as the believers. And this is another Muslim source. Mm -hmm. There you go. So here, once again, we have a situation where we know from the meaning of the word, even according to Muslim experts, whether it's uh, translators or uh, people who are going to make dictionaries or uh, hadith experts or whatever that you've just got Allah praying here. All right. That's that's what it means. Muslims don't want to believe that he prays. So they want to say it means something else. All of the different meanings they give don't fit because those are separate things. And there were perfectly good Arabic ways of saying that Allah does those things. What he says he does is praise. All right. And so. They just have to say it means something else because they just can't acknowledge. They can't acknowledge. They can't bear the idea of their God praying and how this would undermine their attacks against Christianity. And so they just have to stomp their foot and say, aha, we'll laugh at you. And then you, you pin them down and say, OK, what does it mean then? Oh, it means praise. Oh, my goodness. Right. And so, and so this is just a situation where uh, my Muslim friends, <clears throat> this this should be how you react here. Right. When you say, ha ha, you silly Christians, your Jesus prays and you say he's God. When we explain to you how that works in Christian theology, one, you should drop the objection. But two, you should keep the objection that if God is one person, then, hey, if Allah prays, then you've got a problem there. And then you should renounce Islam. Because like, you're, the ones who, you're the ones who regarded that as a decisive, devastating attack against Christianity. But it doesn't apply to Christianity. It does apply to Islam. It does apply to the Allah of the Quran. So now, if you're going to be consistent at all, you have to renounce Islam and believe in something else. If you don't, we can only assume that your real method is just say anything. No matter how false it is, no matter how 
uh, inconsistent you have to be. Anything that you can attack Christianity with, you're going to attack Christianity with. And anything you can say to defend Islam, even if it's completely false, even if you're completely inconsistent, you just don't care. Your real method is say anything in defense of Islam, show no integrity, and use any attack against Christianity, even if it's completely false, even if it's completely misleading. And you have to acknowledge that that is your true, true methodology. And our question would then be, what kind of religion forces that methodology on its adherence? What kind, what, why would the truth need this sort of method to defend itself? Yep, 100%. All right, Sam, we have a, a few minutes left. We'll take a couple of comments here. Uh, this one is a, is, a, is a little off topic, but I'd like to take it because this is from a former Muslim who... Um, I don't know if it, the person's just not a Christian or... Um, the person's an agnostic or maybe a theist, but doesn't know if Christianity is true. Uh, says, I'm a former Muslim, and I'm just wondering, where were the Son and the Holy Spirit mentioned in the Old Testament? So oh, yeah. what are some passages for the Old Testament? Uh, yeah. Pick either one, Son or Holy Spirit, and then get yes. passages let's, on that. There's much more references to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament than the Son. Not because the Son wasn't there, because he's not called son as often as we find in the New Testament, but he's there in the Old Testament. So quickly, David, if you want, go to Second Samuel 23, verses 1 to 3. Good question, by the way. And guys, this is why we want to keep doing these shows, so that we can answer these objections, <clears throat> have a library <clears throat> of recordings where we answer these questions in depth for your benefit to use to glorify Jesus until we see every Muslim bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Second Samuel 23, verses 1 to 3. Again, here's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jehovah, identified as God who speaks. 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 3. Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling over... How far did you want me to go? No, that's it. That's the three. Did okay. you catch it, David? In verse two, it says, the spirit of Jehovah spoke by me. Mm -hmm. So the spirit is a speaking person. He speaks. Mm -hmm. He's not just an active force. His word is on my tongue. But then verse three says, it's the God of Israel speaking. Mm -hmm. So notice the spirit of Jehovah, when he speaks, that's God speaking. And David knew this a thousand years before our Lord Jesus showed up on, on the scene, right? Mm -hmm. Now go to Psalm 104, verse 30. We're going to look at just a handful and we'll... Look at one passage that I think it's the most explicit witness to the sonship of Christ in the Old Testament and that he's essentially co-equal to God, which we looked at yesterday. Mm -hmm. But if you go to Psalm 104, verse 30, who creates, who recreates, who replenishes the entire earth and resurrects men? Psalm 104, verse 30. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So when he sends forth his spirit, notice the distinction, David, your spirit, that's two, right? But he sends this spirit to create them. In the context, it's talking about those who die. When you take away their spirit, they return to the dust. Then you send the spirit, you, he creates them, meaning resurrects them, and you re replenish the earth. This shows the Holy Spirit is creator, life giver, and he must be omnipotent and omnipresent to resurrect the dead wherever they're at and replenish the entire earth. So here are attributes of deity ascribed to the spirit belonging to Jehovah. Now go to Job 33 verse 4. Job 33 verse 4. Let me know when you want me to stop on the Spirit and go into the sonship, because right. I can be right. here all day. Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So the Spirit made Job, made man, because he's echoing the Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 accounts of creation. So the Spirit of God made me, made man. When God wants to resurrect the dead, recreate them, he sends a Spirit to do so, and he replenishes the earth, attributes of deity, because he's creator, life giver, Omnipotent, omnipresent. Go to Isaiah 63, verse 10. So let me know when you want me to stop. With this and then show the yeah. sun. Okay. Isaiah 63, 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Now notice two things. His Holy Spirit, that's a distinction again, right? Mm -hmm. His, Jehovah, and Holy Spirit. But notice it says they grieved his Holy Spirit. Last time I checked, the Joe's Witnesses try to convince me the Holy Spirit is an active force. How do you grieve an active force? Because it says the Spirit can be grieved, which means he has emotions. Therefore, he must be a divine person, distinct from Jehovah, but inseparable from him. Mm -hmm. That same chapter in verse 14, what does it say about the Holy Spirit? Same chapter, Isaiah 63, verse 14. What does it say? 
Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. Okay, this is talking about Israel being brought out of Egypt, preserved in the wilderness, and brought into the land of Canaan. Notice it says, the Spirit of Jehovah gave the entire nation rest, preserved them, provided for them, and brought them into the land of promise. Here it says the Spirit of Jehovah did it. In Exodus 33, 14, Jehovah says, I will send my face ahead of you, I will give you rest. So in Exodus 33, 14, it's Jehovah who gave his people rest. Here it's the Spirit of Jehovah who gave them rest. And then in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's up there, man? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Now, do you want me to talk about the sun, or yeah. do you want me to continue yeah. with the spirit? Uh, yeah, go with right. the sun. We, okay, we, let's go. We, we can go into more detail. Uh, uh, deity of the, the, uh, the Trinity in the Old Testament and the deity of Christ in the Old Testament and the deity of the spirit in the Old Testament, these are all topics that I'm sure we'll be covering over and over again. Yes. And so I'm just going to I think this one, because it's the most powerful, we're going to look at Proverbs 30, verses 3 and 4. So let me repeat. The sun has been active throughout the Old Testament, but in the Old Testament, we have less references to him as the sun as we do in the New Testament. So he is the sun in the Old Testament, but he's not identified as the sun with the frequency we find in the New Testament. So I'm going with this one because this is the most explicit in my, my view. Proverbs 30 Verses 3 and 4, but just read 3 first. Mm -hmm. so we can I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Now, because it's English, you won't be able to tell unless you can read Hebrew or get a transliteration. We can, we can get Muhammad Hijab to teach us Hebrew on this one. Remember, remember what Elijah means. God is with us. Don't forget, it's the same meaning as... <laughs> man, man. Anyway, <laughs> verse 3, Agur is saying, I do not understand, and the word there is plural, Qaddoshim. The word for Holy One in Hebrew is Qaddosh, that's singular. If you look at the Hebrew, it's Qaddoshim. Literally he says, I do not understand, I cannot comprehend the Holy Ones. He's talking about two divine persons who are beyond his ability to comprehend. Now who are those persons mm -hmm. that are beyond his ability to fully comprehend and understand? Verse 4 tells you. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. Now by name, folks, again, get any good commentary, this will be confirmed. Name doesn't mean, hey, what's his name? Is his name Tom? Name in the biblical world, worldview, in the biblical mindset means a person's characteristics, his nature, his essence, his authority. So it's basically saying these two divine persons, God and his son, are beyond comprehension because they do things that we can't understand, such as ascend and descend, <clears throat> establish the ends of the earth. They have the waters in the, in the fists of their hand. Yet notice it's not just God. It's his son who does it. Tell me the nature of this being who can do these things beyond comprehension and explain to me the nature of his son. That this son is Jesus Christ. Notice the first part of the verse. Who has ascended and descended, right? Who has ascended and descended? Tell me what is his name, the one who ascends and descends, and his son's name, who also ascends and descends. Now go to John 3, 13 and 16 for the answer, David. So basically, as you go to John 3, 13 to 16, Agur knows that God has a son who's just as incomprehensible as God, beyond understanding, and could do the things that only God can do because this son is equal to God in essence and glory and power. Who is that son? John three thirteen to 16, Jesus answers the question, who ascended and who descended? What's the answer? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Hmm, that sure sounds like the, the question that Agur asked and Jesus is answering a thousand years later, right? Mm -hmm. Keep going. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus seems to be answering the question of Agur. Who has ascended, descended? Tell me what, what, what is his nature like? What is his son's nature like? And Jesus comes a thousand years later and says, Here I am, that son who ascends and descends, the son of God who became the son of man. So Agur knew by revelation, God has a son who is equal to him, 
just as incomprehensible as God is, who can do the things that only God can do. Proverbs 30, verses 3 and 4. No wonder he uses the plural form for holy ones, Kadoshim, because he has God and his son in mind. Mm-hmm. There you go. All right, it's about 10. We'll take a couple more quick questions here. Well, one, because uh, Muhammad Rahim here which makes gives us an excellent opportunity to, to sum up here. Muhammad Rahim says, If Allah does Salat, He sends His blessings. If we believers does Salat, we are asking blessing from Allah. Sam, we, start, we, we started this live stream off by pointing out that in a, it, just two live streams ago, when we showed that Muslims keep claiming that our argument for, for saying that Jesus is the Son of God is that, well, he didn't have a human father, so he must be the Son of God. They took that as our argument because that's what their apologists tell them is our argument, even though none of us use that argument. And we pointed out that this is a false claim. That's a straw man. That was the point of the video. And then the Muslim response, we put, if, if for those of you who tuned in late, just go back and watch it after we're done. Um, the Muslim response that, that came up in the comments section was, so you Christians say that Jesus is the Son of God just because he didn't have a human father. Well, that would make Adam God as well. Why don't you worship him, right? It, and I said, it feels like we're talking to a wall. Yeah. And then we started talking about spiritual blindness, right? Spiritual blindness that that is just so prevalent, so prevalent in the Muslim world. And here... We sit there for over an hour talking about the meaning of Salah, and then we refute the standard Muslim objection that it really means sends blessing. And you went to Muslim sources. You went to Muslim sources showing that Allah's blessing is different from his Salah. Yes. It's distinct. Yeah. And you quoted Muslim authority saying these can't mean the same thing. His Salah can't mean blessing because it says separately to, to to request Allah to send his blessings. You showed that. And the response after all of this is, well, if Allah does Salat, he sends his blessings. It's like, just pretend that Sam didn't refute that in like 30 different ways. <laughs> well, I mean, what do you answer? I mean, how are you going to answer that? No, nothing. <laughs> you, you can just say, uh, uh, Muhammad Rahim, just go back and watch it over and over and over again. And I'm saying this because... I know what that spiritual blindness is like, right? Um, I was arguing with a Christian and uh, attacking a Christian back um, before I became a Christian when I was still an atheist. And I remember trying to read the Bible so I could refute him. And I read John chapter one, Sam. And Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand anything it was saying. And I read it over again. And I I mean, I I was reading philosophy and science, uh, all kinds of things. I was reading Stephen W. Hawking. And I couldn't understand what the the prologue of the book of John was saying. And I read it over and I couldn't understand it. And I read it again and I couldn't understand it. I was saying, what? The stupid Christians understand this. Why can't I? And I read it over again. And I had to keep reading it and keep reading it and keep reading it. And I keep reading it. And then finally I go up to the Christian that I was I was persecuting and I go. So so Jesus is the word. And he goes, yeah, it's right there. Right. And so, I mean, it took me reading this over and over and over. So I know, I know that there is this kind of spiritual blindness, so I have some sympathy for it. At, this, at the same time, though, it's, it's so incredibly frustrating that you have to say something 50 times. You have to refute a point 50 times. Everyone else can immediately understand the refutation, but there are so many Muslims who can't, no matter how many times. You could refute it in 50 different ways. They still just don't get it. Yeah. You know, it's amazing, David. It, it, it's even blindness with, in regards to their own religious sources. It's, it's one thing if I quote the Bible and they can't comprehend it because it's foreign to them. I'm quoting, you're quoting Muslim authorities telling us what the Arabic means, explaining it, and they still don't get it. Yeah. They don't even get what their own Muslim authorities are saying. I mean, how much clearer? And he prays this, by the way. If you ask him, if you ask Muhammad Rahim, when you pray five times a day, and you send the prayer on Muhammad. Do you not ask Allah to bestow his salah on Muhammad and his family like he did Abraham and his family? And then say, send your barakah, your blessing on Muhammad and his family like you sent your blessing, barakah, on Abraham and his family? In your prayers, you're distinguishing salah from barakah, prayer from blessing. In your prayers, unless he doesn't know Arabic, maybe, again, to give him benefit of doubt, 
He may be simply reciting the prayers in Arabic and not understanding because that's what many Muslims do. So mm -hmm. there's not much to say to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All yeah. right, one last thing and then we'll have to close out. We've, got, we've been going over two hours here. Don't forget, tell them part two tomorrow. We're going to continue this Yeah, tomorrow. part two, and so the Muslims can come back and uh, regroup and come up with some other meanings for the word Salah, which totally contradict even even their own dictionaries and their own sources, but they can do it, and I'm sure they will do it. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be back tomorrow with, with, uh, with video clips. Um, but this is from Sarah. She says, uh, God bless you guys both and keep up the good work. My question is, did the name Allah come from a previous pagan religion and some of the traditions also, can you clarify on that? It's yeah. just what I've heard. Yeah. Uh, my take on it, I've written a multi-part series showing, and this is just my position, I know there are Christians who may disagree, the term Allah was used by various groups across the board in reference to the God they consider to be the supreme God. So Jews used it, Christians used it, but the pagans also used it for their God, who wasn't the same as the God of the Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. It's similar. It's similar to the English term God. If I'm in a room, you have a Hindu, you have a Buddhist, you have a Christian, you have a Muslim, I say, praise God. All of us would say, amen, right? Mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. I get specific and I define the God I'm praising, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the only one who's going to praise that God is the Christian. So there is evidence, both in the Quran and sources outside the Quran, <clears throat> that indicate that the term Allah was used by Jews and Christians, was used by Jews and Christians, and by pagans for their for their deity who wasn't the same as the Christian God. That's my take on it mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. sources that I've studied. So that's my position. I may be wrong, but so far that's what I've discovered from my studying of the primary sources. So uh, a generic term for God that even Christian Arabic Christians and Arabic Jews and the Sabians could use and did yes. use, but... Uh, pagans could also use it as part of their pantheon, and then Muslims came to take it as a kind of proper name for God. Yes, right, exactly, yes. Because Allah, when time became contracted, it means Elila, the supreme God, the God. So you had no other term to describe the one supreme God or the only true, true God you believe but besides Allah. So for the Christians and Jews, he is Allah because he is the only God. For the pagans, it would be a reference to the high God, but not the only God. So it depends on who's using it. Yeah, and uh, one one simple way to see this is uh, is Muhammad's father's name was Abdullah. Abdullah means slave of Allah. So, yep. so there exactly. there were even even in pagan Mecca, uh, people who uh, worshipped Allah as part of as one of their gods. Yep. So all exactly. right, well, uh, we've been going over two hours now, so we are going to get back tomorrow. We have uh, let's see, Alex here asks, what time are you going? Are you guys going live tomorrow? We'll be back same time, eight o'clock. Yep. And we'll uh, we'll be looking. Yeah. And keep praying for us. God bless us. Preserve our children, our loved ones, our families, and provide for us to do this. Because again, we need the provision from Jesus to do this for His glory and the filling of the Spirit to do it justly for the praise of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So God bless you and watch over you. Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, and uh, and 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 Sam, we our initial plan was to go live on uh, Sundays and. Wednesdays because those were good days that worked out for both of us but yeah. um, we just have some opportunities this month specifically to yeah. go live a bit more than that so we're gonna we're gonna go live as much as we can for for this month so uh, everyone treat this as kind of a crash course we'll keep uh, taking the objections uh, uh, that Muslims give to the topics we're bringing up and learn those responses and then when you use the same arguments you're going to get the same objections from muslims and then you'll have the answers so treat this month like a kind of crash course we'll go live as as, as often as we can all right all see right. everyone tomorrow lord willing eight o'clock p.m eastern standard time god bless everyone